Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Sitka. Uh, thanks uh, for, for waiting on uh, Carrie and I as we just get ourselves organized to start the 13th session of the MSAB. We'll do a, a couple of uh, housekeeping things to open the session and then get right into it. Um, so first of all, welcome everybody. I recognize most faces. There are a few new faces though, so we will do a quick round of introductions uh, after uh, some of the orientation to the building. So the commission staff have very graciously provided some hospitality in the corner over there. There's coffee and water uh, to my left. Uh, lunch is here at 12 most days, or in this building, 12 most days. Washrooms, if you haven't already found them, men's is out the door here and to the right. Women's is to the left and then left again, I think. Um, there is Wi-Fi in the room. The uh, conference ID and uh, passcode is just uh, to my right at the back of the room there. Uh, and if folks, everybody has name uh, plates. If you could turn them around so everyone around the table could reach them, please. Just so we can call each other by names and not hey you. Uh, that's great. Um, so I think that's it for any housekeeping things. Anything else, Carrie? Um, There's microphones, obviously. Sorry, red light means it's turned on. Yeah, the the red light in the middle for the microphones. Um, and uh, I, I yeah, I think yeah. you covered it. You said okay. lunch at twelve and. Yeah. Oh, and and uh, for those that are staying um, at the the Westmark, breakfast is there as well. So uh, hopefully, folks found that this morning. Um, otherwise, there still might be some scraps left behind if you run back. Um, Okay, so I think that's for housekeeping. Quick round of introductions, if folks could. Uh, Where's the muster point? The muster point. Yeah, that's a good point if there is an emergency. Where is the muster point in this building? If there was a fire, earthquake, where are we going to go? There's an exit door right behind us. Uh, and we can probably muster in. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a collection just across. At the West Mark. There you go, Robert. Good work. Um, okay, so introductions. Maybe name. Your uh, affiliation, like what you're uh, what you're here for uh, this week. I'll start if that's all right. So my name is Adam Kaiser. I work for Fisheries and Oceans Canada. I'm based in Vancouver, and I'm one of the co-chairs for this process. I'm Carrie McGilliard. I'm also one of the co-chairs for this process, and I work for NOAA at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. Um, where I am a stock assessment scientist uh, and I do management strategy evaluation type work over there. Uh, and I also serve as the science advisor on the US side of this process. Alan Hicks, IPHC. If you don't know me, you will by Thursday. Uh, Robert Hockness, uh, Commercial Fisherman, Canada, uh, live in Prince Rupert. My name is Jim Hasbrook. I work for the Alaska Department of Fishing Game Division of Sportfish. Thanks. Morning. Um, I'm Anne Marie Huang. I work for Fisheries and Oceans Canada. I'm the Canadian Science Advisor. I'm Dan Falvey. Um, I work for Alaska Long Fishermen's Association and a fisherman here. And welcome to Sitka. This is my hometown. My name is Angel Drabnika. I work for one of the Community Development Quota organizations um, in Alaska, the Aleutian Pribilof Island Community Development Association. I live in Juneau. I'm a fisherman. I participate in the salmon and crab fisheries there. Um, this is my first MSAB meeting. Thank you. Hi, I'm Matt Damiano. I'm the ground fish and halibut biologist for the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. I'm based out of Forks, Washington, so I am right at home with this weather. I'm Michelle Culver. I work for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and I'm here on the MSAB as the representative for the Pacific Fishery Management Council. Forrest Braden, uh, Southeast Alaska Guides Organization, also uh, Alaska Sport Fish Rep, uh, new here. Uh, you probably don't recognize me. Hopefully I'll know you by Thursday. And um, I also uh, hold, so I have a charter fishing business, but I also hold the commercial fishing quota, halibut quota, so it's me. Chuck Ashcroft, uh, I'm on the Sport Fishing Advisory Board for Can in Canada, and uh, I'm a halibut committee chair now. Um, the motion, I guess, from the Groundfish Shellfish Working Group chair, but at any rate, I'm here exactly the same reason to learn and try to 
get up to speed after a few a few of these meetings. So thank you very much. Chris for uh, Commercial Fishing Sector Canada. Uh, good morning. My name is Jim Johnson. I'm the executive director for the Deep Sea Fishermen's Union. Uh, we are the oldest and sole remaining fishermen's union left in the United States. Uh, we represent uh, commercial halibut and sablefish fishermen out of Seattle. Happy to be here. Uh, per Odegaard, fishing vessel owner and uh, member of Fishing Vessel Owners Association. Brad Miro, Canadian processor. Uh, Glenn Merrill with National Marine Fisheries Service in Alaska Region. Uh, Scott Mazzoni, I work for the Quinault Indian Nation on the outer coast of Washington, and I'm a uh, 2A tribal representative. Tom Working, a recreational rep, uh, 2A region. Uh, Jim Lane, uh, work for the Channel Tribal Council, uh, Canada. Peggy Parker, I represent the Halibut Association of North America, both Canada and the U.S. processors. First of all, excuse my voice. Uh, Dave Wilson, the uh, executive director. Um, we also have a power support team over the back, so if I could pass to, um, let's go from Keith, please. Yeah. Hi, good morning. I'm Keith Jernigan. I'm the IT uh, and DDB Services Branch Manager at the Commission, and I'm here to support the meeting. Good morning. I'm Ed Henry, and I am a fisheries uh, uh, data specialist uh, specializing on bycatch with the Commission. I'm also here to support the meeting. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Fira Carpi. I just started as the MSC researcher at IPHC a month ago. Morning, Ian Stewart. I do the assessment and I uh, help out on Alan's support team. Uh, my name is Steve Verikoff. <coughs> Excuse me. My name is Steve Verikoff. I'm with IPHC, um, MSC programmer. Uh, uh, welcome, everybody. Oh, oh. I'm Sarah Webster. I'm with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game Division of Sport Fish. I'm the statewide bottom fish coordinator. Thanks. And is there anybody on the webinar? I think Steve Keith is on. There's a few folks on the webinar, which is actually uh, one other thing I forgot to, to mention is that uh, this is uh, being we uh, webcast. It's being recorded as well. Only the audio, though, I think, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the audio and the slides. And slides, okay, and the slides. And then uh, attending online is Lamont uh, Nelson and Rachel Baker, as well as Steve Keith. Welcome to to those online. Um, are the is the audio okay for folks in the room? The mics are sufficient. Okay, great. Um, and then yeah, we're going to have some other more in depth introductions with the uh, MSE team as well. Yeah. So um, for a number of years, there's been recommendations. Um, at various meetings, MSAB meetings, annual meetings, SRB meetings, to um, hire one, a programmer, to help with the MSE, and then to hire MSE researcher. And so now I'd just like to say our team is put together, and I'm very excited. Uh, this is a really strong team, and I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on who we are. And it reminded me that it's been three years since I've introduced myself, really, to this MSAB group. I remember Bruce Gabra saying in 2016 of May, uh, May of 2016, we want to know who this guy is. So <laughs> this is a little reminder, especially for the new people. Um, I come from basically a fishing background because I love to fish and um, did some fisheries work in California at Humboldt State University, counting millions of salmon eggs. Realized I didn't want to work on salmon after that. Um, <laughs> and so I um, did, uh, realized I liked math at that time, and which was pretty crazy. Uh, I was taking my last math class I thought ever in my life and the calculus, and the instructor said, you should do a math minor. And I said, no way. So I ended up doing a statistics degree in University of Idaho, working on salmon again. And this time I said, I'm really getting out. So I did my PhD on orange ruffian in New Zealand. I got about as far away from salmon as I could. Um, 
but my background comes from fishing in California, um, unloading fishing boats on the docks and things like that. And, and I was really interested in getting into fisheries because this, exactly what we're doing this week, is what I wanted to do, have dialogues with stakeholders and be that interface between management and fishing and, and help stakeholders understand and help managers understand the decisions we need to make. So this is really exciting work for me. Um, and I have a bit of experience working in the assessment world since 2001 in New Zealand. Worked for NOAA for seven years, actually shared an office with Ian Stewart for three or four of those years until he uh, coerced me into joining the IPHC three years ago. And um, so I don't have control, Ed, from the keyboard or, so there's Steve. Steve, you wanna talk about yourself a little bit? Uh, so I'm Steve. Um, Nice to meet you all. Nice to be here. Last time I was at this meeting, I was uh, one of the remote participants, and it was my first week. So it was a bunch of disembodied voices talking about Alibet. So um, it's good to see everybody in person. Um, I live in uh, Boulder, Colorado, um, and I'm supporting IPAC through um, programming expertise. Um, I've got a very varied, a varied background, as you can see up there. Um, my background's in physics originally, but I've done um, a little bit of all kinds of things, uh, programming obviously, but uh, management and leadership in different organizations. Um, worked for an ecology organization, did some oceanography, archeology span way, way in the past. So um, Pierre actually asked me this morning uh, why I came to the APHC and, and part of the reason was um, I keep, uh, I love to do lots of different things obviously, but I like to do things that actually have an outsized impact on, um, on, uh, on, on missions and so, I'm hoping to do the same here. Uh, good morning again. Um, as you might have uh, noticed, I'm not uh, from uh, this part of the world. I come from Italy and uh, I took my uh, master's degree in marine biology at the University of Padua. And uh, when I was there, I started becoming an observer discard on board uh, some trawlers and I realized that I actually I uh, enjoyed the fishing part of marine biology and I actually wanted to be more involved in that. And so uh, I started working uh, at the Research National Council and there they offered me to carry out a PhD in marine biology and ecology and I was mostly involved in uh, a small pelagic uh, fishery, so very different from uh, uh, what I'm working on now. Um, and uh, afterwards, I spent seven years there. Uh, then I moved to UK. Um, I started working in a federal federal agency. It's the Centre for Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture Science, uh, um, northeast from London. And there, uh, I kept on working on small pelagic assessment. Uh, I did a bit of uh, management strategy evaluation, um, and I was involved in the management of the species. Uh, we worked a lot with stakeholders, uh, trying to engage with them. We had several projects with them to um, assess the small pelagics in the area. Um, I did some consultancies for the General Fisheries Commission for the Mediterranean. Uh, it's the RF. Um, for the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea, uh, and for them I carried out uh, a management strategy evaluation for small pelagics again. And then uh, a month ago I started working at the uh, IPHC, uh, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, it's a honor for me, and so I'm very glad to meet you all. Yes, Peggy. I was just curious, are you living in Seattle or working remotely? No, I'm living in Seattle. Yeah, I just moved to Seattle, yeah. And Steve, you're working remotely, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, well, welcome to both of you. Uh, it's exciting to have more people on board the uh, MSE team. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I thought I'd take us uh, through uh, a picture of what the agenda looks like for this week. and. Um, so that everybody kind of knows what's coming up. This morning, uh, we have some uh, business to conduct in terms of going over MSAB membership and uh, reviewing what's happened at the meetings over the course of the past year. Um, <clears throat> taking a, a short look at the program of work, uh, and then we'll have a chance after the break today uh, to review management strategy evaluation uh, and 
get some basics on that. So I think that will be helpful for both the new people on the MSAD and observers that, that come and for all of us to just review um, review what happens in an, in, in an MSD. We'll be talking a lot about goals, objectives, and performance metrics as we move from uh, questions concerning the coastwide simulations uh, to um, uh, distribution questions. And uh, we will also be reviewing the evaluation of coastwide fishing intensity. And uh, if you all recall, uh, we saw at the last MSAB meeting, we made uh, a recommendation uh, to the commissioners on that. And Alan went away and did uh, a few more simulations uh, um, to experiment with management procedures that uh, might constrain uh, variability in catch and from year to year. And so we will, we saw some of those results at the annual meeting and we'll also see them at this meeting and aim to make a recommendation on that, um, hopefully or by uh, about midday on Tuesday. Uh, moving on from that, we are going to talk about uh, distributing the um, distributing catch limits among areas and our objectives for that, and also some uh, potential management procedures. That's something that we'll be doing at this meeting and at uh, uh, one or two future meetings as well. And then we'll get a more detailed picture of the program of work to come after this meeting. Uh, and of course, we at these meetings do report writing before we leave, so we'll be looking to do that. Um, and uh, it, and there will be a, a report writing group each evening if you would like to uh, join in on that. And I believe I do have a list that we can come back to later of uh, who volunteered uh, to help with report writing at this meeting. Uh, so we'll review that uh, later in the day. And. Uh, We've uh, lost Alan for just a minute, but I think that uh, Dave, uh, would you like to go over um, membership? Uh, one item is, is everybody comfortable with this agenda? It's been posted oh, yeah. for a while. Is there any points of clarification that you need? That there, when we had developed it um, like a month ago, six weeks ago, I don't know, a long time ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We put in a fair bit of, of buffer time, given that this is, as folks would probably recall, the spring meetings are usually more of a, a brainstorming session to give Alan a, and the team a giant laundry list of things to do over the summer. So we, we do have a bit of flexibility in the schedule. Uh, but aside from that, are there any other points of clarification or questions from folks? Dan had a question. <clears throat> I think I pointed this out to Alan in earlier comments, but I, I know we're supposed to review the goals and objectives um, this afternoon for both coastwide and distribution. We don't really talk about the distribution framework until tomorrow afternoon. And that's kind of a cart and a horse that a lot of times as you start talking about more about how you're going to explore the distribution part, then other objectives come to mind. And then some of the objectives you come up with earlier on, you won't be able to achieve because you just can't model them. And so I just want to make sure that we have some space after that on Tuesday afternoon to revisit our objectives and refine them. And perhaps objective time this afternoon, um, realizing that there'll be a bit more work to do after we've had our discussion tomorrow so we don't, so we have some space and, and divide the conversation in half. I think you mean on Wednesday afternoon. Um. Looking at uh, from 2 to 4.30 on Tuesday, we're developing a framework to investigate distribution. And after we have that discussion, I think is not precisely afterwards, but we need that discussion before we can finalize our objectives on distribution at some point. Yeah, so if you look down on Wednesday afternoon uh, at 3 o'clock, uh, we have an opportunity to revisit um, uh, goals and objectives relating to uh, distribution. Uh, so ho hopefully that, that takes care of that niche. Uh, and I think Alan will talk some more about th this iterative process and being able to come back to objectives as we go along. So. I think there will be multiple, in the bigger picture, there will be multiple opportunities to revisit objectives um, and, uh, and to think about what an objective is and, and, and um, how it relates to management strategies that are, or management procedures that are being put on the table. Does that answer your question? I'm glad you brought that up, Dan. Yeah. yeah, are there any other concerns about the agenda or? Okay. Um, all right. Great. So we will uh, we will adopt this agenda unless there are objections, and um, we'll move on to uh, membership.
Great, thank you very much. Um, I'll try and be brief so I don't lose my voice completely. Um, as you're aware, the MSAB has been changing over the last couple of years, and we had a couple of departures from the MSAB membership uh, in, in the, the past uh, 12 months or so. Um, the most recent of which was actually uh, Craig Cross uh, from the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council has um, tendered his resignation from the board uh, due to other commitments. We haven't as yet received a replacement nomination. Uh, the council appoints their representative directly, um, and I imagine that will happen between now and the next MSAB meeting <clears throat> in, in October or so. In addition, we had um, obviously Bruce, Bruce Gabriels uh, unfortunately passed away um, the past year, and, and we've looked to uh, fill his position, um, as, as well as Martin Pache uh, resigned as well. As a result, we uh, put out a call for expressions of interest in the MSAB membership, and on the 17th of April, the commissioners appointed the following four new members to the MSAB those being Chuck Ashcroft as the Recreational Sport Fisheries Representative from Canada, uh, Forrest Braden, the Recreational Sport Fisheries uh, Alaska Recreational Representative from the USA, uh, Mr. Jim Johnson, who's the Commercial Harvester um, Representative or one of the representatives from the USA, uh, and also Angel Dubrovnika, uh, excuse my pronunciation. Um, and now we had to put you in a basket of a processor or a, a fisher, and so we put you in as the processor, but we can certainly play with that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So those are the four new members to the board, and uh, your terms will expire in uh, four years. Um, so you're you're here for the long term. In addition, we have um, four, six, sorry, six uh, MSAB members whose terms were due to expire on the eighth, so this coming Wednesday. Uh, and so in that same process, the commissioners extended the terms for those six um, MSAB members for a, for the, for the, for a further four years. Uh, and those are Mr. Jeff Kaufman, who's also sent his apologies for this meeting, uh, Scott Mazone, the USA Treaty Tribes representative, uh, Peggy Parker, USA Canadian Processing representative, Brad Moreau, Canadian Processing representative, Tom Marking, um, the USA Sport Fishing Representatives, uh, and of course, uh, Adam Kaiser, the DFO Direct Government Appointment, Government Appointer. <clears throat> the paper three that you see on the screen, so that's dated uh, at the start of April and doesn't include these new appointments. They will obviously be populated with those appointments from the 17th of April decision from the Commission, uh, and we'll appoint that, uh, attach that rather to the, the report itself. And so at the risk of losing my voice completely, I'll, I'll wrap up. There. Thanks, Chess. <clears throat> Thanks, Dave. Um, and um, I, I can cover anything if your voice gets lost. Just let me know. Um, but I, I just wanted to make note that the um, the new members and the reappointments are also outlined in Circular 2019-010, which is available on the IPHC website um, and is shown on the screen um, right here um, if you want to review your reappointment and how long you are reappointed for. <laughs> uh, so uh, on, on membership and appointments, there's uh, two points I'd like to make. Uh, first is it, it is a, a, a big commitment. I think it was maybe Bruce Gabriel. Someone around the beginning of the session said it's a four-year appointment, but it's a life sentence. <laughs> and it's, uh, I, I hate to say it in jest, but I mean, it, it, it is an important component in that, uh, as many of us have found out, uh, a big piece of the success for a process like this is about the relationships that you develop around the table with one another, that there's a certain level of trust in putting out these objectives and procedures, uh, that a certain level of understanding, we're speaking the same language, to make progress. So it, it is important that folks are committed for the long term uh, and that folks are able to attend the meetings as they're, uh, as they're scheduled, uh, which we know meetings for years into the future now. So. Uh, that, that's the first piece. The second piece, though, is uh, just, you know, genuine appreciation. It is a big time commitment for, for folks to participate in this. I mean, I'm, I'm, this is my job. I'm paid to, to be here. But for many others, this is uh, a lot of volunteer work or above and beyond what your quote-unquote regular job is. So thank you for the folks that are, that are here, for the folks that have participated for the past number of years, and hopefully are going to continue to participate into the future.
Uh, yeah, Alan, would you like to take us through uh, an update on what happened at the last MSAB, the Scientific Review Board, the annual meeting? Yes. Uh, thank you, Carrie. The, um, there's document 04, and uh, just to note that all of the MSAB documents are on the IPHC.int website um, and under meeting MSAB 013. If you have any trouble finding that, please let me know and I'll, I'll direct you to that website. Um, so in document 04, uh, update on the actions arriving from the MSAB 012. And if you can just, do I have control, Ed, or? Okay, perfect, cool. I'll just scroll down this way. And that's just not allowing me to go. Let me try that. There we go. Okay, so um, now for some reason I don't have control. There we go. I guess it's got to be in the window, I guess. Okay. Um, Okay, so in the appendix of document 04 are a number of recommendations that came out of MSAB 012. I'm not going to go through every single one other than noting many of them are completed, and I just want to highlight a few that were not completed. Um, so let's see. So um, one of the big recommendations was this one, MSAB recommendation 03. Uh, Coastwide fishing intensity SCPR should not be lower than 40% nor higher than 46 with a target about 42 to 43 and a 30-20 harvest control rule. Um, and there was a bunch of rationale given for this in the MSAB 12 report. Um, so I've marked that as completed. It was presented at the annual meeting to the commissioners and the commissioners responded to that. Um, something that's in progress and you, you, you may learn in an MSE is um, there are a lot of things that will remain in progress or at least be revisited over time. Um, performance metrics to be evaluated. Uh, request was that the same performance metrics are calculated for recreational sector. Um, this is in progress. I've began uh, including performance metrics related to recreational sector in um, this MSE Explorer, which I'll introduce to you all tomorrow. Um, and I should mention to you today, give you the website address sometime today in case you want to look at it tonight. But so, so that is in progress and we can see some of those metrics when we discuss results tomorrow. Um, let's see, go down, a whole bunch of stuff completed, that's all good. Uh, uh, a couple of things pending here, uh, request four was the IPHC sector provide a report at MSAB 13 on IPHC and other relevant research um, activities related to relationships, et cetera. And I note that this request is actually pending now because due to the remote location uh, here in Sitka, it wasn't feasible to bring our entire research staff up here to give a presentation at this MSAB. So what we will do at subsequent MSAB meetings is bring in the research folks as appropriate to present on the activities ongoing that will feed into the MSE process and the decisions that we'll have to make at uh, MSAB 14 and MSAB 15. So another pending request is identify preliminary management procedures related to distribution. Um, and this request, we will try to uh, address this request at this meeting on Wednesday. We have an agenda item specifically for discussing management procedures related to distribution. And then finally on the bottom, there is a in progress. Uh, this was the continued uh, to develop the concept of the fishery footprint. And I haven't told Pierre yet, but this is a task I'll probably assign to her. Um, <laughs> no, it, it's, um, it, it's something that now that we have a team, we can easily um, start addressing some of these other requests that are really important that I just haven't had time to revisit. So those are the things that I'm really excited about. Was that the last page on this document? 444. Great. Um, so lots of things completed, a few things ongoing. Any questions on that? Um, I was just curious, then, will we hear from your staff on the research under request four at the beginning of our next meeting, or is that undecided? 
I, at this point, it's undecided, and when we work on the agenda for the next meeting, we'll we'll probably fit it in to specifically relate their presentations on the decisions we'll have to make at that meeting. And those decisions are related to um, how we're going to um, parameterize, you might say, the operating model and the assumptions and scenarios and variability we're going to um, introduce into the operating model simulation. So. Um, we're, we're already working quite extensively with the research uh, staff on doing that, and then we'll get we'll present to the MSAB as appropriate. I saw Chuck's hand. Yes, thanks. Um, this is my question in regarding to the, uh, the the metrics for the recreational fishery being that, and I didn't know where that had come from. Obviously, the last MSAB meeting, but uh, is that going to be fully developed and, and explained as what those metrics are going to look like? in this meeting or is it just in going to be in progress it's just the context of having the same metrics as commercial when the fishes are so different and and it is in progress so i'm just curious as how that uh, arose and so that it's in actually as a recommendation thank you yeah thanks chuck um so the the, the background on that is we had some, um, so, so we have these primary objectives, which are mostly what we'll see at this meeting, and then there's a whole lot of other performance metrics that are reported uh, in, in the results. And um, I don't have any specific presentations on this, but an appendix of document, the objectives document, is that 08 or 07, I think? Um, that the appendix of that document has a whole list of other um, objectives and performance metrics. And what we realized at past MSAB meetings, I was reporting things like uh, the probability that the commercial catch or, or the commercial catch limit is greater than whatever. And we didn't have any specific metrics related or objectives related to the recreational fishery. So at this point in time, I've included similar metrics for the recreational fishery as are reported for commercial and, and other other fisheries. But um, we, if, if it's requested, we can look at those objectives um, and come up with specific objectives related to the recreational fishery as you see appropriate or others see appropriate. Yeah. Yeah, just a quick clarification regarding the request for and the biological and ecosystem science um, research program. Um, as discussed with the co-chairs just before the meeting, the, the intention is to try and refine exact, refine exactly the types of things you would like to hear about um, in preparation for that October meeting. <clears throat> the um, research program itself and how it could be utilized and, and impact the MSE process um, in many ways is sort of endless. And so if we can get a lot more clearer direction from you, about the types of things you would like to hear about over the course of this meeting, that would certainly help us. Uh, otherwise, we'll, we'll certainly fill uh, a, a good day or so with those research outcomes and potential um, linkages to the MSE process. Thanks. Uh, so just remember, use your mic if you can. I think Dan's question, though, was uh, would those specifics be at a spe uh, particular point in the agenda or throughout? I think it would be the latter. We throw out the agenda. We'll just make sure we're keeping track. Uh, um, something to flag when going through the report writing each day, or better yet, come join us for the report writing and make sure it's all inserted. Yeah, on, on that note, I can see it kind of naturally coming up on uh, Tuesday afternoon when we're discussing developing a framework uh, to investigate distributing uh, TCEY. Um, it might just naturally come up then, and we can re remember it then, perhaps, as well. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Any other um, uh, clarifications on paper four? Otherwise, I suggest we move on to paper five, which, Dave, are you... Are you alright that one? Or will I will go to Alan. <laughs> That's fine. Okay, for five is, is the SRB uh, outcomes. You sure? Yeah. I, I can. Okay, whatever. Yeah, you need a break. Yeah.
with the SRB outcomes, uh, I thought you were on the next one already. Um, this is the same document essentially also presented to the October uh, MSAB meeting as there's been no SRB meeting in between the, the two last two, well, previous MSAB meeting and this one. Uh, and so those uh, outcomes are, are simply provided as Appendix A to uh, document 05. Um, and there shouldn't be anything new there for those MSAB members who were at, at the previous meeting. Um, for the new MSAB members, we do uh, suggest you familiarize yourself um, with some of those uh, recommended uh, or outcomes from the Scientific Review Board that were endorsed uh, in principle by, by the Commission, and we'll get to some of those in just a moment. Um, Alan, did you want to talk about any in, in more specific terms? Yes, yeah, thank you, David. I, I wanted to, to note one, and that's if you scroll down to paragraph 29 in the appendix there. Um, it says, yeah, the, in the middle of the page there. So a, a, a couple of things just to note in this paragraph that are important is uh, the SRB requested in future iterations of the MSE, estimation error at point A we've, we've already done, and that's what we've been using for the simulations. Uh, but point B is going to be a big discussion point at this meeting, and that's the introduction of constraints on the total mortality limit. Um, ignore Q in that. But the, the total mortality limit, uh, we've inter introduced some management procedures that constrain it to only change a certain percentage every year. Whether, and there's a number of different things that I'll talk about uh, tomorrow morning. Um, so we'll be addressing that request at this meeting. And then the last one is um, related then to a note in the annual meeting report after the SRB presented at the annual meeting. And I'll discuss a little bit about that at the end of um, the meeting tomorrow morning as well. But um, so, so, so just to note, the SRB had a couple suggestions about modifying management procedures on a coast-wide level, and we'll address those at this meeting. Chris, um, two questions. One is, uh, and I think I think you might have just I just want clarity. When you said ignore the cue on total mortality, it was can you just elaborate? Is that a typo? It, it, no, it it was something that I thought would be useful and it ended up not being useful, which is confusing. So think of that cue as total mortality okay. limit. Okay. So there's a difference between the total mortality limit that's set by the commission and the yeah. total mortality that actually occurs in the fishery. And I was right. trying to separate the two processes. So I'll try to use the word total mortality limit to indicate what is set by the commission and the realized or just total mortality for what the total mortality of last year actually was after the um, occurrence of the fishery. You see the difference between the two? I think so, yeah. yeah. Okay. But so, so that's so what you're trying to get at with, with TMQ. That's what you're trying to get at. I, I was it. trying to call it quota. Total, quota, yeah, total mortality specified in quota. We dealt with it last time. Okay, yeah. I just want to make sure I got that. Yeah. The second one is, and I, th I think you just answered that, Part C, 29C, they talk about simulated coast-wide survey index. Is that what you're saying we're going to look at for management procedures? I just was looking so, and I found that kind of interesting. Yeah, so I have not done any actual MSC simulation. So what this, this is referring to, and we'll discuss a little bit more tomorrow, is a management procedure that does not use an assessment model, but just uses the the survey index in itself to determine what the total mortality limit would be in the following year, like, like stable fish in Canada, so similar approach to that. And um, so I haven't actually coded that in to do the simulations on, but we'll have a chance to discuss okay. whether the MSAP wants to pursue approaches related to that. Okay, we're going to discuss it. Yeah. So, folks may recall, I think Dr. Sean Cox presented that at the annual meeting as yeah. one option for consideration. And it's a, it's a note that I'll remind people from the annual meeting, I'll remind what that note was, and we can discuss how we want to address that. All right. Great. So um, if we can then move on to outcomes of the annual meeting. This is document 06, MSAB 1306. And um, in this document, I'll just, um, a, a couple of things throughout this meeting my general approach to these meetings is to remind during my presentations I usually bring in some of these requests and notes and other things from the annual meeting because I think they're very pertinent um, and so page if you can scroll down to page two the top of page two the um, just a couple of requests that came out of this meeting 
um, and it, just focusing on the top part here, uh, recommended the MSAB develop following additional objective, a uh, conservation objective that meets the spawning biomass target. Um, we'll spend a bit of time discussing that this afternoon, and I'll remind you all the um, sort of leading up to this. And then the second recommendation, too, recommended that the MSAB and IPHC uh, Secretariat continue the program of work for the management procedure on the scale proportion of the harvest strategy, noting that scale and distribution are to be presented in 2021, at the annual meeting in 2021. So we will have, a, we'll have two chances in the agenda to, to uh, discuss the program of work before the break today and then at the very end of the meeting. Um, and we just want to make sure that we aren't overtasking the MSE team um, and that we can actually get things done to deliver what um, the MSAB as well as the commissioners would like in 2021. So um, there's a lot of things we can do. Uh, we just have to remain focused. Um, and then noting, um, let's see, the, the management procedure, they noted at the end of this request the management procedure that best met the primary objectives for the coast-wide scale was SPR 40% uh, with a constraint on an annual constraint of 15%. So we're going to have a chance to revisit these constraints because we did not look at this at the last MSAB meeting. This was work that I did between MSAB 12 and the annual meeting. So at this meeting, I, I want to look at these constraints and then we'll be able to understand this note that the um, commissioners made in this actual request here. And we'll contrast or compare and contrast that with the recommendation the MSAB made of this range 40 to 46. I, I, I see them as um, uh, working together, so I, I don't see a big problem with it, and we'll have a chance to discuss that tomorrow. Um, and other than that, I'll wa be walking through different notes and requests throughout the presentations, but are there any other um, insights from the annual meeting that people might have or questions at this time? Chuck. Yes, Chuck Ashcroft here. Um, I guess it's, it was mentioned the last MSAB meeting and or in this SRB meeting and recognized as the, the proper approach scientifically and then reaffirmed in uh, the annual meeting on utilizing bioregions mm -hmm. first. Technically, is it scientific when you're actually just following regulatory lines and is it really yet Establish that the way you've developed them is actually a biological region. I mean, the, the regions don't just change structure and biology and halibut grounds at a line. And there's crossovers. Right. Has, 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 has your technical team looked at whether or not 3A is part of two in one respect, like as far as grounds? I'm just not. Yeah. I'm just not satisfied that biology or these biological regions are, in fact, actually accomplish anything, because you're going right back to regulatory areas and it's the same boundaries. So. Yeah. So um, it, that's a good point, and we have had a lot of discussion. We have years of discussion on this. In fact, before I arrived at IPHC, Dr. Ian Stewart did a lot of work on this when developing his assessment models and. Um, what he identified is there really are four different areas along the coast that show somewhat different life histories, realizing that there's a lot of mixing going on. Um, and what's, what's really happening, I'll just be really brief about this, but what's happening is we have a coast-wide stock of halibut. They tend to move over time between all of the regulatory areas across the years, but within a year, from the tagging work and, and other investigations that we've done on size at age and other, other things like that, it appears that halibut tend to stay within a biological region and make in, uh, migrations within a year that tend to stay within that region. For example, a fish from Puget Sound was found to go up into here off Sitka, spawn, and then head back down to Puget Sound. But you're exactly right. These are just lines in the sand. They aren't exact lines that we can say these are where the differences occur, but they are in the, I can't remember the quote the SRB put in their report, they are currently the best option for biological management of the stock. And where these bioregions come in is that we, we, we want to pres or conserve some sort of spatial structure of the stock, but we don't need to conserve the spatial structure from a, from a, a biomass conservation point of view 
for each little tiny area. If we preserve the spawning structure in these four general areas, the current research suggests that we would be then conserving um, spatial structure in a way that would help to protect the overall coast-wide biomass of the stock. So in that sense, we're not trying to draw the exact biological um, changes and delineate the halibut stock into substocks. We're just identifying broad general areas that we might want to consider in defining the conservation objectives. Now, when we get to fisheries objectives, that's when the regulatory area is really important to a fishery objective. So when we're defining conservation objectives, we want to think about conserving the, the, the general biology of the stock, which seems to be if we have this spatial structure across biological regions, we should be okay. But when it comes down to your fishery or his fishery or her fishery, that we want to look into the regulatory area because that's where the quota and the limits are actually set, and that's what's important to each individual stakeholder. So um, we'll have a chance to discuss more of this when developing the objectives as well. But um, there's um, some review in past reports, and I can help you find these statements. Um, but the SRB, we presented this uh, extensively to the SRB over the last year and a half or so, and we finally came to the conclusion that's the best that we can do at this point, given the knowledge that we currently have. <clears throat> Michelle. Thanks. Um, I had a question. I'm not exactly sure who to direct it to, but um, I'm been maybe I'll just see what your thoughts are. Um, but I've been trying to reconcile the commission's uh, statement uh, items 61 and 62. So in item 61, the commission agreed with the MSAP uh, recommendation um, relative to the range for SPR, the target SPR, and the harvest control rule. But then um, item 62, they recommended that we continue our work um, and noted the, the management procedure that best uh, meets the primary objectives is a target SPR of 40, not the 42 to 43 that they agreed with the MSAB in the previous. And um, the 30-20 control rule is the same. So was just trying to reconcile those two relative to guidance and then it, of course, I also noted that the decision was not at target SPR either for 2019. So um, just wondering what the, the thoughts were relative to these in terms of guidance for MSAB. Thanks, Michelle. I, I think many people are trying to reconcile the, these two paragraphs. And, and the way that I see it is the when this was presented uh, from the MSAB report, the MSAB report presented um, their results from MSAB 012, which did not see any of the constraint runs that I did and presented at the annual meeting. So there's a little bit of disconnect between what the commissioner saw versus what MSAB saw when they made the recommendation that the commission agreed with in paragraph 61. Um, so uh, what the way I see these two paragraphs is the Commission's agreeing with the MSAB that this looks like a reasonable um, recommendation from them. However, they recommended we continue the work on the scale and that the MSAB really review that work at this meeting, which we'll do tomorrow morning, and take a look at what I presented at the annual meeting, and I, I have more of that now, to take a look at how the annual constraint fits into this process and how the, the ranking of procedures and identifying the best performing procedure can um, also identify a single management procedure. So I, I see it as the, the MSAB or, or the commission is just noting for the that there are more results out there. And with these additional results, if you were to simply rank them based on the primary objectives, this would be the, the best management procedure that results from that. And we'll visit this tomorrow and we'll see if the MSAB actually wants to update 
their recommendation of this range in the 42 to 43 um, percent during this meeting. And then I further note that during the recommendation from the MSAB and MSAB 012, there was, and I'll talk about this um, later this afternoon, there seemed to be this unspecified objective where people were uncomfortable with the spawning biomass going less than 40%, for example. Um, and so there was this unstated objective that seemed to play into this recommendation from the MSAB, and, and I'd like to explore that a little bit this afternoon and see if that helps to pin down the management procedure in the range here, and we can present that to the commission, and then maybe that will bring the two more into alignment with each other if the commission and the MSAB are operating on the same set of objectives. So we'll definitely be discussing that throughout this meeting. Thank you. So once again, thank you, Michelle, for asking that question. It's given me a little bit of a springboard. This is a 30,000 foot question, but also pretty fundamental. So forgive me on both counts, but there are so many moving parts to this process and we've really narrowed down taking scale first and then distribution second. And in that, that process, I'm sure all of us, at least um, I have certainly seen all the other things that will be affected by these um, decisions and are represented in the modeling. Some, most, most of them are, some may not be. But at some point, once we have a recommendation for a full harvest policy, will there be, um, is this a, a continuous process to look then at all of these sometimes competing, sometimes complementary moving parts and be able to present on a silver platter the results of our work on a policy, a harvest policy to the commission? Yes. <laughs> I, uh, I mean, Alan, correct me if I'm uh, if I'm wrong here, but uh, we just because of the, the the size of the issue, we we chose as a group to break it down to scale and distribution. To get something to demonstrate on scale, we can get um, demonstrate some progress, maintain some momentum. Now we're doing that for distribution, then we have to put everything back together. Uh, the work plan outlines that is happening through the. Uh, subsequent year. So last year's scale, this year's distribution, then it's both both together. Uh, that there. Yeah, yeah and, and just furthermore, it, it highlights the MSE really is an iterative process where we learn something, we see results, we learn some more, we might see more results, we learn more. So it, 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 I'm not as worried about these two paragraphs because I see this as part of the iteration and it just got out of sync a little bit between the MSAB and the commissioners and what the both groups were seeing. And in 2021, leading up to that, and we'll talk about the work plan shortly um, or just review quickly, but um, I'm really hoping that to avoid this little bit of inconsistency that we got into or the, the presentation of the results that the MSAB really has the full set of results, but if we identify something in that in last MSAB before annual meeting in 2021, I may be directed to go away and do a little bit more work or identify a little bit of more work that I want to do um, to actually present to commissioners. So to, to, to that point and to Michelle's point about the reiteration, my interpretation of what we see on the screen was that uh, the commissioners agreed with our recommendation. That's a good thing. They endorsed the work that we did, and they said, hey, but we realize there's some other work that's happened. We know that of that additional work that's happened, there's one that actually performs better. We know you guys are still working, though, so um, we'll, we'll support what you've done so far. Tell us when you've got new information or if you've had a chance to look at the new information. also spotted these two paragraphs, and I'm glad you brought them up as well. My takeaway was that, to me, we didn't adequately address the ranking procedures in our recommendation. I mean, we're basically, we're, um, how you rank something is one piece of information, and we may not choose to take the highest ranked one for other reasons, just because, you know, there's some things that we haven't encoded into our tolerances or our ranking or our probability that affect us on that. Just like in contracting law, you don't always have to take the lowest bid. There can be additional considerations that make you choose some other thing. And we didn't actually articulate why we didn't take the highest ranking one. And I think 
next time we make a recommendation, I'll be sure and note that we specifically didn't choose the highest ranking one, so there's no confusion about whether we considered it. And, you know, we can talk about additional layers of conservancy wanting it, or perhaps the tolerance metrics aren't perfect, and rather than spending weeks revisiting our tolerance, we just decided to make a decision. So, to me, it was kind of a, a wake-up call on how to report to the commissioners. Yeah, and I think we can look at that as we go along and um, revisit how we're doing the rankings. You know, if we're not picking the number one, then maybe we should revisit how the rankings are done. Um, but I, I, like Adam, I, I interpreted this as, as saying, uh, we agree with the recommendation that the MSAB made, and uh, we note that the work is ongoing and that, um, and that the, um, and that there were new results and this, these were the new results sort of period at the end. So it still leaves it open for, for the, in, in my interpretation of what they said to move forward and do our own ranking given the new results. Thanks. I appreciate that. And I guess, um, it, and maybe we will get more into this when we talk about the work plan going forward. But I, I had the same thought that um, Adam expressed where we were looking at scale and then distribution, then we look at both of them together and come up with a silver platter presentation of, um, of them together in, in 21. But I guess what I was thinking is that what we presented to them as our recommendation that they agreed with in 61, and then in 62, the first sentence of 62 was a recommendation that we continue working on scale. And so I was trying to reconcile that with movement to looking at distribution and then coming back to two of them together. So I was looking at 61 is potentially narrowing down what we did on scale and them agreeing with our recommendation, but then immediately 62 was, we recommend you continue working on that. So I was trying to figure out exactly, does 61 narrow our focus on relative to scale that we can then move on to distribution and then circle back in 18 months to two years, or um, are we to continue working on scale before distribution? Say Alan and then Chris. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. And I think this relates to we have to bring back, I believe there was an MSAB recommendation for me to actually continue working on scale as well um, and to bring back the results of these constrained uh, management procedures. So I think that, in my mind, was the intent of the recommendation to continue working on scale so that we can identify management procedures that actually met all of the primary objectives. Because if you remember, the management procedure recommended by MSAB did not meet the variability objective. So, um, so and, and, and this was, the commission realized the work had already been done. The MSAB had not seen it. So let's bring it up at MSAP 13. And, and that's what we'll do here. I see after this meeting, depending on the recommendations of the MSAB, um, which I, I think the re recommendation was really start focusing on distribution. Um, so we, uh, I see if we, what I present tomorrow morning should satisfy the commission request to continue working on scale. And then they note that the management procedure was ranked in the best way. So, so I think we'll satisfy this line. Uh, yeah, I was basically going to, Alan sort of made the point. I think it's just, there's new information. This is an iterative process, and we're that's what we're doing. I also note, though, 59C, it talks about a new conservation objective, right? So that, in turn, is new information that could affect the scale work. So I think they're just saying, look, you've, you've got some new direction. You've got new information and some new direction. There needs to be some additional work. That's how I took it. And I think we'll satisfy all of those at this meeting. So. Okay, re really good questions and discussion. Um, uh, Alan, did you have more to go through no, on, this? on this? Okay, uh, and um, and so perhaps we can move to IPHC rules of procedure. Uh, Dave, do you want to do that one? Yeah, thank you. I'll be very quick with this. Uh, you may recall at the last MSAB meeting, uh, a number of improvements to the MSAB 
specific rules of a procedure were proposed and agreed to by the, the board. They were put to the commissioners at the annual meeting and subsequently adopted. Um, most of those were surrounding the intercessional processes, uh, in the need or potential uh, utility of having ad hoc working groups and also the elimination of the steering committee, uh, and then also in terms of reports and recommendations and how they're provided <coughs> excuse me, to, to the commissioners each year. So they, they were already pre-endorsed by yourselves. Um, they are available as the 2019 rules of procedure. Um, rather than reading through them all uh, in terms of the overall objective, which is, was my intention, just to remind everybody what the um, general mandate of the MSP is, um, I'll probably just drop those into the report as a noting paragraph, with the exception just to remind everybody that the primary role of the MSAB is to advise the Commission uh, on the management strategy evaluation process. And you do that through your second meeting in October each year where you provide clear recommendations and guidance for the commissioners to consider. The rules of procedure then contained uh, in paragraph two of appendix four, uh, a number of core objectives for the MSAB. And as I said, I'm not gonna um, read those out. We'll just drop them into the report as a general reminder for uh, additional parties who are interested in, in, in understanding what the MSAB's role is. And then also that uh, noting those objectives, just to recall that the MSAB um, via the management strategy evaluation process is a stakeholder informed, obviously scientifically driven process. And so it's just important to reinforce that that's the, the overall, <coughs> excuse me, role of, of the MSAB. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Chair. <coughs> Chuck. Yeah, a quick, uh, uh, maybe recommendation uh, in you uh, refer to sport and subsistence and commercial, but in Canada, we don't refer to recreational fishing as sport. So maybe, and so in section one and section three, you refer to the same, same and then down uh, in the subsections of three, you do refer to recreational slash sport. And I'm just wondering if that would be a recommendation just to change that aspect. And in fact, in Canada, we're about ready to start calling it the public fishery and not the recreation, but recreation is suitable. So, uh, Chuck, could I say that the, the suggestion is, is more some um, uh, clerical, uh, just, just clarifying uh, the definition, making sure there's some consistent terminology throughout the, the rules of procedure. Yeah, that's your request. And to follow up on that, um, IPHC Secretariat has been working on standardizing their language and, and what they call it. And, and Ian, what, what, what's the term? Is it recreational fisheries that we're using? So we're trying to refer to it across the entire coast, all regulatory areas, as recreational fishing from an IPHC context. And, and so, so I think sport might be something that we just need to update from things that slip through the cracks. I would say it's not really changing the intent of the rules procedures. It's more just a housekeeping yeah. piece. I think it's something that's reasonable we could put forward as part of the you know, evergreen document that it is. Any questions on the rules of procedure? Or I, I think the you know the main point is we're here to guide the commission on the management strategy evaluation process, which includes. Uh, many things other than recommending a management procedure that's defining objectives and, and a lot of these things that are listed in the paragraph two of this appendix. So um, it's useful to review every once in a while. Okay, so not seeing anything else on agenda items 3.4.1. It looks like we're actually right on schedule. Uh, so I suggest we move on to the final agenda item before the break, which is a review of the, the program of work. This is paper 10. I think. Yeah, it, what, so we, we talked, I, I talked with the co-chairs earlier, I guess a month or so ago about the agenda and we thought instead of just jumping into all the agenda items, it might be useful to just have a brief look at what our program of work looks like for the next two years. So this is Appendix A of Document 10, um, and then I will give a short presentation on Document 10 at the end of this meeting, so we'll then revisit the program of work. But for now, this is the 
the, what, what I envisioned, or, or what, what actually what the MSAP came up with um, at their last meeting at, after modification, for what the next two years is going to look like for the MSE team and reporting back to MSAB and annual meetings um, through 2021. And so if you notice, here we are May 2019 in um, Sitka, which is great to, to get out of Seattle and, and expand our horizon a little bit. Um, and we're, we're actually going to do a lot of these things. We're going to evaluate the additional scale management procedures. That's a discussion we were just having, these constrained management procedures, which I'll explain to everybody. Um, review goals and objectives. We'll do that this afternoon. We'll discuss a little bit about spatial model complexity and identifying the framework, the general framework for which the MSE simulations will be done to investigate distribution and scale. Um, we'll then talk about management procedures related to distribution and, um, and review the framework. Um, and then finally, at the end of this meeting, we'll then look at this program of work and see, did we identify anything that needs to be changed or does this still look good plan for the next two years? At the October meeting, so as a reminder, May meeting is really a guidance meeting for the IPHC Secretariat and the MSE team to um, on what their summer vacation is going to look like. And the October meeting is when we'll really work on some clear object or clear recommendations for the commission at the annual meeting. And so you see there's a lot of similar things coming up in October, but hopefully those will be refined. And what's new in October is to review the uh, multi-area model development. So what that is, currently the, the team is is um, programming uh, operating model that can uh, do the simulations and report performance metrics on the scale that's been identified by the MSAP. So that's biological regions, regulatory areas, and make sure that make sure that it's reporting the performance metrics as identified by the MSAP. So that's things like the the recreational sector um, in 2B, for example, or something like that, or the commercial fishery in 3B. So, um, and that's why a lot of the work we're doing at the MSAB is important for that development, so we know what we need to develop to meet, satisfy the MSAB. Um, and just to note, that development of the multi-area model, this operating model, will also be reviewed by the SRB. And so the SRB will be taking a look at a lot of the real technical details of the operating model. Um, I'm not going to show the MSAB any equations, but I will show the SRB the equations. We'll talk about this is how we're parameterizing the regime changes in recruitment over the next few years and, and things like that. But the MSAB has an important role in that operating model development in identifying the hypotheses and the scenarios that they believe should go into um, the simulations, and then we need to parameterize them. So um, next October will be a, a little bit technical in that sense, but I'll bring back with what the SRB thinks of the um, development that we've done over the summer as well. The annual meeting in 2020 will simply be an update on progress. We haven't really planned to have any concrete recommendations or, or uh, of results coming out to them in 2020, but we'll see what we get to tomorrow with the coastwide simulations. We may have a new recommendation that we do want to bring forward um, to the commission at the annual meeting. So there is that potential as well, and then that would satisfy paragraph 62 on their recommendation of working more on scale. 2020 is going to be a big year. We're hoping in May 2020 to bring preliminary results to you all. Um, and after reviewing the goals and objectives and the multi-area operating model. And this will give the chance to see the results. And I think it's, uh, I think Dan mentioned earlier in this meeting that sometimes we need to see the results uh, where, you know, is the cart before the horse. And we need to see the results to appropriately define the objectives to then identify how we want to modify management procedures. That was a little bit of the conundrum we got into last year, whereas I presented, really we saw the first real results in October. And people said, oh, yeah, great. What if we did this and this and that? And then I had to do that before the annual meeting. We didn't get a chance to review it again, the MSAP. So I'm hoping to avoid that by presenting preliminary results in May, have a clear guidance for what to do. And you see October is just a couple of agenda items. Make sure we're operating on the right goals and objectives. Review those results. And then 
uh, and actually those results should not be preliminary in October, so we might want to update that. So review the results of the first full MSE and then present the complete MSE product to the Commission on scale and distribution management procedures in 2021. So this is great. We're all on either a two-year appointment. You have two years remaining in your appointment. So that goes through the MSAV uh, 2020 October meeting, or you've been now appointed for four years or reappointed for four years. So I think we're all good for the next two years, and we should get a lot of work um, done. Yeah, Dan. So I appreciate that explanation. I noticed you focused mostly on the model development, but could you walk me through your mind on how we're going to be developing the MCs for distribution between the next two years? Like, what are some of the milestones? Like, what do you expect to accomplish at this meeting? How will the October meeting either add to or change that? I mean, yeah. what that, are the tasks? Yeah, a, a, a great point, Dan, and I think that's probably the weakest uh, my weakest point in this meeting is the the development of these management procedures right now. Um, and, and I'm definitely open to guidance from the MSAB on this. We have on the agenda pretty much most of the day Wednesday to discuss management procedures, unfortunately, um, due to time constraints as well as um, other things. I just haven't had the... the um, I don't know, I just haven't come up with any good management procedures to add to the list already created by the MSAB. So I'm hoping at this meeting we can really go through that list we put in the MSAB 12 report where we identified some potential tools to, um, to, uh, to use in management procedures and maybe begin to identify the specifics of those tools and how they could be applied into a management procedure. Um, so yeah, and then our summer job is going to be to really focus in and identify some management procedures that um, are more detailed for us to review that we can then go away before May and actually do some simulation results on and, and see, are these management procedures performing as we expected them? And then how do we want to update them in May and then go away that next summer um, with some really clearly defined management procedures in May that we're testing and bringing back in October? So um, that's something that I'm hoping for guidance from the MSAB on as well. So, so the, the list that, that uh, Alan's referring to from the MSAB 12 report is in paper 09, it's section four. It's the list that we roughly brainstormed at our last October meeting. Um, my thoughts on it is that we have a list there. It's a good place to start with. It could use a lot of work. And I think at the very least from this meeting, we should come out with a few, um, a few specifics. We should translate at least a few of these points into some specific procedures that the commission staff can go and work away on. Uh, I don't. This I don't see this meeting as being the be-all, end-all for defining the candidate procedures for distribution. We should put forward a few specifics, but this is not going to be our one and only chance to to put them forward. I would agree. I think when we were putting together the original calendar, we realized that. This group can have some input on the model, but it's really limited on the equations to put in. But where we really could have some effect is refining management procedures. And so I think it'd be good at this meeting to figure out a little bit more detail on what that looks like so that in October, if there's any staff work that needs to be done to help us take step two, we can have that done. And likewise, at the May meeting, we can kind of start blocking out what type of progress and support we want to see to help us down the path of having something concrete a year from now that can then get pushed through the model, right? Michelle and then Chris. Thanks. Um, I had a similar question, Dan. Um, so when I look at the the tasks that are described for this meeting at the top of Appendix um, A, the very first line of the evaluate additional scale management procedures, and I was looking for something similar relative to the distribution and I didn't see it. I didn't see where we necessarily come back and evaluate the distribution management procedures and not only as it relates to distribution but perhaps as it relates to scale and what the effects are on scale from the distribution management procedures. And I saw that as kind of the key um, steps that we need to take before presenting our recommendation. 
Yeah, thanks, Michelle. And that was when I was reading through the list, I realized in October 2020 that we need to remove the review preliminary results there and replace that with evaluate management procedures related to scale and distribution. And so that's really the, 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 the goalpost that we're aiming for. Um, but I, I think it's good that, you know, we keep tying in, this isn't just distribution, this is scale and distribution. And um, in the, I think in the entire process, as we go through all of these meetings, now think about it as scale and distribution combined. And when we present the framework, hopefully that will become a little bit clearer. Yeah, and I, that's a really good point too, in that um, as we move towards a spatial operating model, uh, the results for uh, the scale component of the management procedure uh, are, are likely to change in some way. Uh, and that is just part of this iterative process to keep in mind uh, that as we incorporate more details about space, uh, the, the results may also change. Chris. Um, most of what I was going to say has already been mentioned in various things, but what I, I think for me would be useful, and I know the rest of the group and Dan sort of touch on this, is when I try and think about management procedures, I'm sort of like, what are the questions that, like, for instance, we, when we're talking about developing management procedures, a list of questions that if we're thinking about management procedures, you know, what Alan needs for us to sort of, if we're going to put an idea forward, what kind of things we should be thinking about so that if we put forward an idea, it's got maybe a little bit more to it than just the concept, if that's possible. I just think because as we've learned in this process is what we decide in May, we come back in October and go, well, that, that didn't work. Uh, we got to change this or do that. So I think in our discussion, it might be useful if we, I don't know if it's a list of questions or just things that to keep in mind when we're talking amongst ourselves with each other, with our constituents. Okay, you want to look at that idea? Here's the things that we need to, be, need to bring to the table to make that, to help Alan translate that idea into a, a, a model, something that can go in the model. Yeah, thanks, Chris. And we'll, we'll actually talk a little bit about that when we talk about objectives, because the, you want a management procedure to meet your objective. So there's actually, it's really circular. Sometimes your objective actually informs how you develop your management procedure, as we saw with constraint. We, we needed to put a, something into the management procedure to meet the objective of stability. So. Um, We'll talk a little bit about that during this meeting, but yeah, we'll, we'll go away um, or, or maybe during this meeting, we'll think about what can we provide to the MSAB to help them um, identify management procedures that can then feed back into us. So. I, I agree. I think that's something that'd be <clears throat> quite important to come out uh, from this meeting is, is helping the group to decide how, how do we actually define a management procedure? Like what are the components that are most important, what's the terminology that we need to use that is something that's useful for staff. I mean, right now, looking at the list and in paper 09, section four, tools that we identified as distribution procedures include you know, relative harvest rates. I'm pretty sure those three words are not sufficient to define a manager, distribution management procedure for staff. So we'll need to figure out um, how best we describe this that is useful. Um, let's I, I, I'm going to suggest that we, by uh, by Wednesday morning, try to get to that point. Looking at the agenda Tuesday is when we talk about the developing the framework. And once we've had a chance to look through the framework uh, for distributing um, TCEY, we hopefully we'll have a better understanding of what some of those components of the procedure will be. And then we can maybe talk more on Wednesday. Does that work, Alan? Yeah, I think Wednesday will be the perfect time to actually discuss not only management procedures, but how to develop management procedures. And then just to note that we will revisit this table as well as the five-year outlook on um, Thursday morning. And I have a presentation on that one. So so I'm, the co-chairs and, and myself thought it would be good to talk about this program of work as a little reminder where we're heading. Um, so people have it in their mind as we go through this meeting, and then as we get on Thursday, people would say, hey, we need to update that with, as Michelle has already noted, what's our really goalpost here? And we need to identify that clearly in this table. Okay, Michelle? Thanks. So um, a few minutes ago, uh, I think when we were going over uh, what the status was following up from our previous discussions, uh, we noted that we wanted to 
um, throughout the meeting make note of potentially some additional specificity relative to the research work and the um, connection to the environment. And so, Alan, when you started going through this two-year work plan at the high level, um, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but you said something to the effect of the MSAB is to identify the management procedures and the scenarios that we want you to model. And then your job is to parametize them. And then the SRB will review how you've parametized them. And so uh, just in, in what I was thinking about relative to the IPHC research and changing environmental conditions is relative to that step of parameterizing them and how you've done that. And so to the extent that there is um, ongoing research or information that would suggest um, the parameters to focus in on relative to changing environmental conditions uh, and to what degree um, we should perhaps not uh, constrain the results. Um, that is kind of what I was thinking. So if we're using past data to uh, feed into the model to inform what the next 100 years will look like, if we believe there are changing environmental conditions that may affect one or more of those parameters, and perhaps to a greater degree than what we've seen in the previous 60 to 100 years, then that was what I was looking at to help inform the modeling. And the, yeah, I, I think that perfectly fits the paradigm that I'm thinking about. And w when I say the word parameterize, I'm talking about let's use a gamma distribution with the theta parameter to do this with whatever. I, I don't think those are the details we need to go into in the MSAB, but the details we do need to go into is the um, the assumption in this scenario is that climate change is going to have this type of effect on the future simulations. And so I think the MSAB will be aware of those details and can comment on those details and have guidance on what scenarios they want to, to see as well as, and I was trying to remember the term, I can't remember the term, There in the MSE world there's this idea of scenarios which are real plausible hypotheses that could happen in the future, and then there's sort of these extreme events, which might happen, not likely, but we want to make sure our management, we understand how our management procedure might respond to those extreme events, so we can identify that range of products for this, but I, I'm probably not going to get into the details of different probability distribution functions. <laughs> All right, uh, I don't see any more questions. Uh, and so we're at a break time, and just before the break, I wanted to uh, come back to report writing for this meeting. Uh, I was able to pull up my list from the last meeting and saw that the people that are signed up for doing report writing in the evenings are uh, Chris Bohr, Matt Damiano, Peggy Parker, and myself. And for October, uh, they are Chris Bohr, Matt Damiano, in, in my place, uh, Joe Morelli and Peggy Parker, uh, and there has been a little bit of what, and and Adam will also participate in the report writing. There has been some turnover on the MSAB, and um, and uh, we're definitely would welcome more volunteers for report writing. I think it was Peggy that said that, um, and and I agree that um, I think you get different things out of the meeting if you know that you're responsible for report writing in the evening. Uh, um, and so it can be a, a good experience for just uh, learning how everything works and, and just also um, what you get out of the meeting. And we have fun, too. That we make yeah. jokes. And, we um, and it doesn't take too long, either. I think we usually stay maybe an hour-ish. Until we burn out. Until, <laughs> until we burn out or we get uh, hungry. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, so yes, uh, if anybody would like to volunteer, uh, you can raise your hand now or you can uh, let, let one of us. Uh, no, or you can just show up tonight. Um, and those of you that are signed up, you might just want to keep it in mind so that you can take a few notes during the day, et, et cetera. Uh, and on that note, we will. Um, okay, can I make one quick um, yeah. note? Um, I have a lot of adrenaline running, so I'm perfectly warm. But um, is uh, the temperature in the room okay with everybody? Okay. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, so we're going to take a, a 15 minute break. Uh, we, we've gone through kind of the housekeeping items and uh, now we're really into the, the meat of it. So um, we'll take our 15 minute break, get back together. There, there are a few new observers. I see a former commissioner who's just joined us. Welcome. So we'll maybe do uh, um, uh, just a quick hello to those folks and then get going. Yeah. All right.
Uh, well, now we're to the point where we can get into some interesting things and uh, review some of the um, concepts uh, of management strategy evaluation. And um, we have some observers here now uh, who are uh, who are perhaps here to hear that and what what comes afterwards. And we were wondering if you all would be interested in introducing yourselves. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, Linda Benkin, I'm a commercial fisherman here in Sitka and ex halibut commissioner director of Alaska Longline Fishermen's Association. Good morning, Charles Clement, a commercial fisherman. Tad Fujioka, I'm a subsistence halibut fisherman. Terry Brincevich, I have a halibut quota in a skip category in the southeast. Stephen Rhodes with SPC. Yes, uh, thank you and uh, and welcome. Um, one of the goals of having the meeting in uh, Sitka was to have it in a place where we could engage more people who are interested in this process. So uh, we're very glad that you're here. And um, and. Uh, <laughs> yeah, perfect timing to get into the. Um, into the management strategy evaluation, uh, and with that, I'll I'll hand it over to Alan. Are you? Um, yeah. Touch going up. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ed. If you can bring up the MSE presentation, MSE 101. So we thought this is an opportunity, um, since we're not in Seattle and we have the chance to engage with some of the stakeholders out in the in the field, um, an opportunity to to discuss what MSE is and to remind people, the new members, especially in the MSAB, um, what MSE is and how the process works and what some of the goals and outcomes of the MSE are. So this is just gonna be a presentation that I've put together on some really simple examples of MSE process, what strategy is, what we have to think about in the MSE, and, and a few other things. Um, and um, yeah, and so I open, you know, I, I encourage discussion here, but I might try to move it along. I think I have 50 or so slides to get through in the next hour before lunch, um, which shouldn't be a problem. But um, yeah, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt, And but um, don't be offended if I say let's get a little bit farther on. So with that, um, here's the outline of the talk, a little history of harvest strategy and assessment at IPHC. Um, some models that are used for fisheries management, how those models relate to each other. Then we'll talk about strategy. That'll be the bulk of this presentation in the MSE, which includes objectives, management procedures, doing simulation, um, and then actually applying a management procedure at the end. Um, <clears throat> and then a brief discussion at the very end on presenting and interpreting results. So the IPHD harvest policy, as you know, IPHD is in its 95th year, yeah. 95 years now, so we're coming up to 100 years pretty soon, and it has a really long history. It's a fascinating history. There's been a lot of sort of um, things or tools used in the harvest policy, things like a size limit that's been in place since 1940, which was increased to 32 inches in 1973 and all areas in 1974, um, and there's been a three-month closure since 1923 during the winter to protect spawning. There's a closed area in the Bering Sea, et cetera. And there have been some things more recently, like slow up, fast down approach, conditional constant catch, um, and then harvest rates that have um, been redefined since about 1985. So a long history, and we are making history as we speak. The assessment, so this is a stock assessment, which used to estimate uh, management quantities, uh, estimate stock status, for example, has uh, a long history as well, and I encourage, if you haven't read, there's a paper written by Bill Clark, former IPHC uh, staff, uh, that is called The Model for the World, 80 Years at IPHD. And he identifies these different eras of the stock assessment, starting with the Renaissance in 1977 when they were using real simple methods of yield, yield per recruit, um, the Golden Age where they had this Cajun model which started getting into age structures, uh, things like that. Statistical catch at age is the more modern age. Uh, Postmodern in the 2000s and then 2012 the present is 
still to be named, I guess, and note 2012 was when Ian Stewart came to the IPHC. <laughs> yeah. We can have that discussion on the side. <laughs> so, but uh, the, the other really interesting history of IPHC is that IPHC is where MSE started with uh, Morris Southward in 1968 did what I feel and many others feel was the first management strategy evaluation. And, and this is amazing, this was 1968. Management strategy evaluation is very computer intensive. And he, he did this really computer intensive um, simulation with the programming and, and state of the art things at the time. And I just can't imagine it. But so he did this, a simulation of management strategies in the Pacific halibut fishery. If you want to see this report, it's online um, at iphc.int, or I can um, <clears throat> get you a copy if you if you want it. But so he really started it all. Did did a really cool project um, on MSE. Then in the 80s, with uh, Rick DeRiso and Terry Quinn, they began to focus on ma on maximum sustainable yield more and a constant harvest rate policy. So they were more into the assessment world and um, coming up with ideas on how we should assess the stop, think stock and thinking about how we also manage it from that assessment. And, and I just want to note, we lost a giant last week in fisheries. Terry Quinn passed away. Um, and so that's a really sad and just a moment of remembrance for Terry. He, he was a big contributor to fisheries and um, a, a great guy. And it's great to have that legacy at IPHC. <clears throat> Then Anna Parma came in. I like to call this the Anna Parma decade. She was amazing, did some amazing things in management strategy evaluation, um, including <clears throat> a paper she presented at Moat Symposium in 2001 on harvest rules in face of uncertain assessments and decadal changes in productivity. Imagine that. Isn't that what we're doing today? <laughs> so she, she is really the precursor to a lot of the work and uh, um, you know, the real stepping stone to a lot of the stuff we're doing today. Uh, Bill Clark and Stephen Hare throughout the 2000s, they came up with these different management procedures or insertions into the management procedures such as slow up, fast down or full down, conditional constant catch. But what was really interesting, they actually defined a bit of a goal for the harvest policy to obtain pretty good yield while ensuring the spawning biomass never drops below an observed historical minimum. So these are some objectives that we're actually working with in the um, MSAB currently. <clears throat> More recent years, Juan Valero started um, investigating migration effects, and he really started to begin having some more stakeholder involvement. And um, Steve Martell really formalized meetings, this MSAB process. He was the first one to lead the, the MSAB. And, and Steve really started uh, educating on the MSE to those stakeholders as well and managers. So they really created a great foundation for the current MSE team to build, I guess, the structure on top of. So that brings us to the most recent years, and this is the last three years since basically I've started, where now we're operating under what's called a SPR-based management procedure. Won't get into the details until a little bit later on that. But you're thinking about it coastwide, managing coastwide and protecting the halibut stock in general on a coastwide level, and then distributing that TCY or the catch limits to the different regulatory areas. Um, into what is important to each of the stakeholders. Some important concepts of this approach are we're now accounting for mortality of all sizes of Pacific halibut and from all sources. So we're accounting for all mortality, um, and that's clear in the process now. We're defining clear objectives, really important to the MSE process. And I just note that we have a harvest strategy policy document on the website. If you go to the commission tab at the top of our website, you'll find on the left a harvest strategy policy. And there's an interesting doc draft, or, well, it's, it's a document released now, but something that we will be updating as we gain more insight from the MSC process. <clears throat> and then finally, defining suitable reference points to which we want to manage too. We'll talk about this more during the meeting here this week. So that brings us, why am I interested in management strategy evaluation? How did I become interested in this? And so this was my baby face days when I used to think this was a fisheries model. 
and I learned subsequently that's not a very good looking model. So I went on to develop better looking models and that's in terms of simulation models and math, um, which looked great to me. So I, I, but I wondered when I was out on these fishing boats, how are these management decisions getting made? And, you know, and, and I heard a lot of gripe from um, other fishermen that I was working with. Um, and, I, and I thought, what information are they using? I'm seeing stuff out here, right? I'm seeing what's happening on the water and I'm not seeing what the managers are telling me. So I, I really, this is how I became in fisheries was I wanted to learn more about it and it just sort of worked into that, um, into where, I'm, where I am, which is great, talking to stakeholders. So what that led me to understand was there's many different types of models for fisheries management. Um, and they aren't the pictures of those models as usually involving equations. <laughs> so we have conceptual understanding, which is really the research, the broad understanding that we want to have about the biology of the stock and how it behaves and all that other stuff. And that's really not what I'm focused on in particular. I think it's very interesting, but we have another branch at IPHD that is focused on this conceptual understanding, and that's our research branch. What I'm interested in is more of the strategic planning. These models that we're using for simulation to look at the long term and how we, what strategy do we want to have for managing the stock. And then that feeds into the tactical decision making like the stock assessment model. And we all learn from each other, but these are really feeding into each other. The, the conceptual understanding feeds into how we look at strategic planning models and then that feeds into the assessment model. <clears throat> Um, so this right-hand portion of the strategic planning and tactical decisions is what I want to talk about today, and that encompasses what is called a management strategy, which also includes objectives of the fishery. So what is management strategy evaluation? That is a process to evaluate harvest strategies and develop management procedure that is robust to uncertainty and meets defined objectives. And those two points are really important at the end there, robust to uncertainty and meets defined objectives. <clears throat> so it is important in this process to define goals and objectives and um, up here at the top, and that's to work with stakeholders and managers. And then to define management procedures, and that management procedure may involve how we collect data, what models we're using, to estimate the, the outputs we need to then apply a harvest rule, like the, the fishing mortality rate, a control rule, how hard we want to fish, how light we want to fish, and, and et cetera. So we identify those two things, then, then the MSE team goes away and does simulation, which is the fun part to me. A lot of coding, a lot of simulation, a lot of computer time. Um, and we present, we, we create a lot of results. And sometimes we can create terabytes of results. And then we have to summarize all those results and present it to the stakeholders and the managers for them to review and evaluate. And then the end product is hopefully application. Um, and that's where we actually implement a management procedure that meets the defined objectives and is robust to uncertainty. But notice here there's these small arrows that are coming back. And as we know, as we've actually discussed this morning, management strategy evaluation is an iterative process. And we learn a lot at each of these steps. We might talk about management procedures and we're like, you know what, maybe we need to update our objectives or our objectives feed into management procedures. We do some results and we might need to go back and revisit our management procedures. So a lot of iteration here as well. Actually, Alan, could you, yeah. or <laughs> maybe you can tell me that we're wait and we do this again, but say to maybe pause here and, uh, so this is what MSE is. How is it different from what folks are probably more used to seeing in regular stock assessment, and that is the key difference here is the feedback simulation, and that we are uh, we're testing out a suite of procedures to evaluate trade-offs and then rank how everything performs. We're not just assuming this one model is the best model and that's the answer, and leave me alone. That that's right, Adam, and and um, hopefully it becomes a little more clear as the presentation goes on. And that's what I was getting at between the strategic planning and the tactical decision making is, is the MSE is strategic planning. It's looking long term, it's, it's incorporating this feedback lo loop. It's not saying there's one best model or the small set of models, but it's looking at what is the potential variability in the stock and how do we want to manage to uh, be robust to that variability. 
the short-term tactical decision-making of the stock assessment is more focused on what do we need to do now? What do we need to do next year? And how should we manage next year? So um, it's looking more at prediction rather than um, MSE is characterizing uncertainty. And I'll contrast those two and see how they, they actually um, intertwine in, in a little bit. So a couple of quotes um, about management strategy evaluation. There's a great paper written by Andre Punt and others in 2014. We used to have this linked on, on a MSAB share site, but um, we can easily get this paper to you. It's called MSE Best Practices. That's what I call it anyways. And it's using simulation to compare relative effectiveness for achieving management objectives, blah, blah, blah. Basically, the really academic way of saying what I said on the previous slide, which Andre is really good at. Um, Tony Smith, another great paper, wrote a management strategy evaluation light on the hill, assessing the consequences of a range of management options, presenting the results in a way that lays bare the trade-offs and performance across the range of management objectives. So you see both of these um, quotes contain objectives, performance metrics, um, simulation, and, and all of those things that are captured in these boxes here. So that's what management strategy of in a nutshell, and I'll go on to give you some examples of this, and hopefully the examples will make it a little bit more clear. But before I do that, we've already talked about uncertainty and variability. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what uncertainty and variability is in um, fisheries models in general. So if we think about it, when our survey goes out and catches some halibut on a skate of gear, that is an observation from a population. That is one small observation from a very large population. And we, we use statistics to then make inferences about what we see and in, in what that is to the whole population. And so really there's two types of uncertainty or variability that I want to talk about. The first is inherent variability in the population. And that's the population varies from year to year. Size at age changes, the recruitment changes. The fish are distributed in a different way every year. So when we go out there and make the exact same observation every year, there's going to be that inherent variability. This variability is what Mark Mangle, a member of our SRB Scientific Review Board, called irreducible variability. It's something that we can't go out and sample more and more and get a better picture of. It's just the, the variability that naturally occurs in the system. And these are the only equations I'll show you guys. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, so that's what I just call the variance of X, um, a random variable, a random process. But then there's the uncertainty due to the sampling process. And this is, if you have a small sample size, you expect there to be uncertainty. As you sample more and more and more, you expect there to be less and less uncertainty. And, and actually, in statistics, it's, uh, there's a relationship where the uncertainty goes to zero as the sample size increases to infinity which basically means you can reduce this level of uncertainty by sampling more and more and more. So, so at the very basic <clears throat> level there, if you were to uh, measure every fish, then you know exactly what's going on in the population. That's right, but we really can't do that, so we use statistics. <laughs> but th that, that's a great characterization. If we really want to know what's in the population, go out and catch them all. <laughs> <laughs> And then we'll have no variability next year either, right? <laughs> so I guess the first one is reducible. <laughs> wow, that was an exercise in logic. Um, but, but really the variability does translate into uncertainty as well. Um, so a lot of people use the two terms interchangeably and I might actually in this presentation as well, I might call variability uncertainty. But just think about it as there's some variation and things aren't, um, always exactly as you, you see them. So an example here on variability in fisheries management is from a Hake stock assessment that Ian Stewart and I both used to work on, um, and this is the most recent assessment. And this is a retrospective look both over modeling, the different colored lines, as well as the shaded area shows the uncertainty estimated in the current model. So this shows you that fish populations are just generally variable. There's a lot of variation. You see the lines go up and down here, and there's a lot of uncertainty in these fish populations as well. Even though we have this huge coastwide survey, which I think is one of the best fishery surveys in the world, 
you know, it's still a small sample size from a very large population. So there's this, there's variability we just have to accept in fisheries management. So what are some of the types of variability that we would think about when putting, when developing operating models and when just thinking about fisheries management in general? And so these are process variation, that's that natural inherent variability of the population. Um, selectivity changes from year to year, recruitment processes, natural mortality, et cetera. Um, parameter uncertainty, this gets into the more of the modeling. This is uncertainty in the estimated parameters due to sampling in the data. Um, how well can we actually estimate what natural mortality is or how well do we um, characterize natural mortality? There's some uncertainty to that and we want to capture that in our simulation modeling. There's modeling and assessment um, uncertainty. Did we create the right model? Um, you know, do we have all the assumptions in the model correct? And um, how are the estimated values going into the harvest rule? You know, if, if our harvest rule depends on stock status, there's uncertainty in that as well. And then finally, there's outcome or implementation uncertainty. And this is if there's a departure from the actual management strategy, that was some variability on the, um, on, on the decision-making process. But not only that, there's the accuracy, accuracy of meeting the established target. So if you say this management procedure says to go out and catch 40 million pounds of halibut next year, I don't think the fleet is going to catch exactly 40 million pounds. They do remarkably well and get remarkably close, but it's not always exactly 40 million pounds. So there's that little bit of implementation, which actually I'd prefer to call it variability, not uncertainty here. There are additional types of uncertainty that have been identified by others, such as Jason Link um, in a paper from 2012. And I think these are important to realize because we are trying to address these in the, M in the MSE process here. Inadequate communication is, can lead to different uncertainties, and that is basically between and within scientists, between and within managers, and as well as stakeholders. How well are we actually communicating outcomes and results to managers such that they can make the right decision? Um, <clears throat> and then unclear management objectives can lead to um, some uncertainty as well. And that's something we're really dealing with directly here in the MSAB, is not only defining clear objectives, but aligning the models that we build with those management objectives. And then another type of uncertainty that you know goes back to my days fishing out there and the, the original questions that led me to get into the fisheries management world were, is what I call perception uncertainty. And this is different views of the fish population. For example, the, the, the fisheries are out there operating in a slightly different way than the surveys, and, and they may see the population in, in different ways. You might see a local abundance really different than the overall abundance of the stock, for example. And this is something that I think is really important to realize and um, really important to embrace, and, and everybody can learn from the different views that we have. So that's different types of uncertainty that go into sort of the models that we build to do this strategic planning. And so remember, strategic planning is to develop a strategy that meets objectives and is robust to variation. This is that MSE process. And the example that I wanna give is my commute to work. This is a strategy that I've developed because it is a challenging commute. Um, but it's a strategy I've developed and I have different objectives. And, and to me, it's like, wow, this is an MSE process that I do with myself every day. So I live uh, near Edmonds, Washington, and it's about 11 and a half mile drive for me to get to work. So when I was considering taking the job at IPHC, one of the considerations was, well, what's my commute gonna be like? And so I bring up Google Maps and I go, okay, great, it tells me, a little hard to see up there, but it's 11.3 miles, I think, and 20 to 26 minutes. No problem. I'm happy with that, right? That's great. Ed knows. He lives up near me. That's not the case. <laughs> um, the problem is the observations along this route, the traffic along this route is variable. Some days there might be construction. Some days there might not. Some days there might be weather. Some days there might not. Um, you might have snow in Seattle, and you're just not making the commute because we don't know what to do with snow. Um, but, you, you know, most often there's traffic, and traffic has an effect on this. So 
So I thought, well, this is a really naive look at me developing a strategy how to get to work every day. And um, so I said, hey, wait, there's some information in Google Maps where I can look at leaving at a certain time of day and it gives me where traffic is along the route typically at that time. And so I did that. I put in like 7 a.m. or something like that. And so that's a factor I'm considering, the time of day that I, that I want to leave. And I identified typical bottlenecks along the route. Look, there's some red areas and stuff. But it's like, it's not too bad. But whoa, wait a minute. Now my commute's 24 to 50 minutes. So that's the variability in my commute. And that's just what Google thinks it is. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so I'm thinking, OK, so I'm considering some factors. You know what? I really don't like that stretch um, at the northern end where it's all yellow because there's this bus there and it always does this really crazy thing. So I just want to avoid that area. So that might, area, so that might be some factors I want to consider. And those become my objectives. And so I'm developing my objectives for my commute. The, the objectives might be something like minimizing time. And I might want to avoid bottlenecks along the route. I just don't like this area because one time um, I got into an accident there, for example, and I just don't ever want to drive that road again. That might be an objective. I might want to avoid street lights. I might want to make as few turns as possible. And some days my commute at the after work, I just want to sit in the lane and drive and not think about it, right? So you want to do minimal thinking. Or, you know, maybe I want to develop a strategy where I'm like, I want to go left, right, left, right, left, right, and, you know, do all these changes and, and see what I can do. But, um, but so I modified my route based on some of these objectives that I had identified. And now I'm still hanging in that 26 to 50 minute range for an 11 mile commute. And just to note, I can bike it in an hour and five minutes <laughs> when I'm in shape. <laughs> so this gets back to management strategy evaluation. It's the process to evaluate harvest strategies, develop management procedures that's robust to uncertainty and meets defined objectives. So in my little management strategy evaluation for my commute, I've defined some objectives on that previous slide. I've defined a management procedure commute route, and I've evaluated other management procedures. How often, Ed, do you like, hey, let's take a right turn here and see what happens if I go this route today, right? You know, every once in a while, you got to shake it up or or Ed tells me, you know what, you should try going over to 8th and up over there. That's, that's sometimes quicker. So I might evaluate that route. Um, so I've evaluated a bunch of management procedures, and I've simulated or tested those through different test drives, and I've applied it. And I've been driving that commute over and over and over again. But that's not the end. Some days I learn, um, you know what, there might be a better way to do this, or they've opened up a new freeway or something like that. So I repeat the process over and over again. And so this is that evaluating the management procedures to meet those defined objectives that are robust to variability. And in fisheries management, we use an operating model to do that. That's our simulation model that simulates what the population might look like and how the management procedure might affect that population. And so um, in this context, when we're thinking of a management procedure, we're typically thinking of what is a fishing mortality rate or what percentage of the population do we want to harvest um, in this context. We don't, we're not really thinking about what is the exact level of catch we want to implement. That's more of an output of the MSE process. What are the couches that are a product of this management procedure? So that's a little different from an assessment as well. The assessment's trying to, to determine what's the best catch level to implement in next year or however many years. So that's sort of the strategy component of my commute, but there's a tactical decision-making process to the, my commute as well. And so during my commute, I can see a short distance into the future, right? Um, I can see the bus ahead that's stopped, or I can see the, the lane that's closed that's coming up, or I might be, in other words, collecting data that tell me about what's coming up in the commute. So based on those data, I make tactical decisions. For example, there's a stretch. If I see a bus, I'm out of the right lane because I know that bus is likely to stop and I get in the left lane and I'll likely get around that bus. Not always, but I likely do. If I see flashing lights or hear a traffic report, I'm listening to the radio, I might modify my route. And so this is the tactical decision-making process. So the strategy can also define the tactics. So that part of the strategy, the management procedure, 
is if you see a bus, move into the left lane. So that's a tactical decision that's actually defined within the management procedure. There's some days where I just think I'm going to beat the commute today and I'm going to deviate from my strategy and I'm going to, you know what, I know I shouldn't go into this left lane, but I'm going to do it anyways. And I'm going to, or I go into the right lane to get around this black truck there and whatever, I might get around him, but he always ends up passing me in the end. So, but sometimes I deviate from the strategy and then I do not know if my objectives are going to be met. So in the tactical decision-making process, it is a part of the strategy. So this assessment model or this estimation model is a part of this management procedure. And it is informing different aspects of the management procedure and helping us make those tactical decisions. So um, the difference here with the tactical model and making those short-term decisions is that it might be putting inputs into the harvest role, but really now the output of this tactical decision process is the catch limit for the next year, for example. And so this is really an output. Remember, the fishing mortality rate is more of an input to the management procedure, and the catch limit is an output. So stock assessment is the tactical decision-making that we're at least using right now at IPHC. And this is short-term forecasting. And really, the key parts of this is we're using prediction models. We're using fisheries data, um, including uh, we're using fishery independent data as well. And the key here is to forecast only as far as the data allow. This is like in my commute, I should only, I can only see so far. If I'm making decisions based on where I can't see, then I might not be making the right decision. So it uses recent data to apply the strategy and decisions makers may deviate from that strategy. And that's important to realize that every once in a while we may deviate from that strategy. So in our management strategy evaluation process, we want to be aware of that. Here's an example from the Hake assessment again, and it shows um, in the red line is the default harvest policy, which showed a considerable decrease, but they, they actually plot other options as well. And this is similar to the decision table that Ian Stewart presents at the annual meeting, where he presents this reference level column and there's other columns in there which are if you deviate from the reference level, which is can be considered a strategy. So in summary of my commute and fisheries management, I obviously have way too much time when I'm commuting to think about these things, um, is that I have a strategy with specific tactics based on observations that I'm, I'm making along that commute route, such as the route and the lanes to be in, and this equates to the default fishing mortality rate, like an SPR and a control rule. How do we want to define that strategy? I have limits that I must stay within, that those are the laws, and you can think of that as shall not overfish, for example, um, which is a law in the Magnuson-Stevens Act anyways. But I apply my strategy making the tactical decisions, um, and every once in a while, that strategy will have a long commute time. Every once in a while, I'll have a shorter commute time. There's variability on that. The key here is, on average, my strategy should meet my objectives. And I should be happy with the strategy. Now, I don't know if anyone could ever be happy with a commute in Seattle, but that's what I have to work with. <laughs> so there's certain things you just have to accept until I get a helicopter. <laughs> So um, up, the question then comes in, should you update the strategy? Should I just stick to my commute strategy for the next, how many years am I going to work at IPHC? <laughs> 30 years. Um, <laughs> um, so, but, but the key is, should I update the strategy? Sure, they're doing lots of road construction out there. They're, they're making new routes. They're bringing in new buildings. They're doing all sorts of things. So every once in a while, probably every year or two for the commute, I should be looking at what I've learned and update my strategy. So it's not something I'm going to put in forever, but it's something I'm going to apply now, um, thinking about it in the long term, but then I might update it in the future with different knowledge. And we got to think about that here as well. This, the MSE process is iterative. We want to revisit this um, at least every three to five years and update it as appropriate. So, okay, so the MSE is a process, as I just said, and we presented this already. You have goals and objectives. You define management procedures. You test those management procedures through simulation. You evaluate them, and you 
choose a management procedure than to apply. So how does that work in this stakeholder guided process we have in the MSAB? Well, we review work that has been done. We're doing that at this meeting. Consult with stakeholders, doing that at this meeting. And those are both MSAB things that we do. We refine, excuse me, goals, objectives, management procedures. That's through the MSAB and the SRB in our IPSC process. We change the inputs and methods through the MSAB and the SRB guidance. Um, we report, really the MSAB's looking to report um, to see those results and make recommendations, and others will see those reports as well. And then we choose the best performing management procedures, and all groups are typically involved in that process. But really what's key here, this isn't linear, and we don't end after we choose the best performing management procedure. We might repeat this process as we learn more. And we've, we've seen this already. We did this with scale, the coastwide level um, control or, or harvest rate, harvest control rule. And we learned a lot, and now we've gone back through the process and we're revisiting at this meeting. So goals and objectives are very important step. They're probably the, the hardest step to deal with. Um, and it requires input from stakeholders and managers. <coughs> However, goals and objectives are not easy to define. Um, and sometimes we don't know what our goals and objectives are until we actually see results. But you can think about goals as defining something aspirational. I want to have uh, you know, the halibut stock out there and be sustainable, for example. And then we can define more general objectives, and then ultimately we want to define a measurable objective with an outcome of what you want, a time frame, when do you want that outcome, and a probability or a tolerance for failure. And once we have that, we just simply develop a performance metric that's reported as part of the results and we can see if it meets our objective. So this is this is a bit of a hard part and the MSAB has been doing a great job working through this um, and defining some really good objectives. So that's a reminder we're defining a management system to meet these objectives and this is really long-term strategic thinking. Um, but in that long term we want to aware how, be aware of how we're getting to the long term. So for example in the um, tuna world, a management strategy might be to, um, or, or an objective might be to rebuild the stock to certain levels, and one way to get there is to shut down the fishery for the next 20 years. But that's not, it would meet your long-term objective, but wouldn't be the best way to get there in the short term. So we wanna be aware of the short, medium, and long term. The other thing is objectives are typically in conflict with each other. The more you harvest, the lower the, um, the stock will be, the, the smaller the stock will be, the more you harvest, the more variability you're gonna have from year to year in the catch limit. So we want to evaluate those trade-offs as well, but the key here is we really need objectives or else we have nothing to evaluate against. And I made this mistake in one of the first MSCs I did with Pacific Hake. They said, we want you to do an MSC. I said, I'm the guy to do it. And I went away and I coded up a big model. I did a bunch of simulation and analysis. I took a couple management procedures, presented it back to the stakeholders, and they said, great. And then that was about how it sounded in the room. <laughs> they said, what does this mean to me? And I said, um, well, do you, what do you want? And that was where we got, we need to define some objectives or else we don't have anything to evaluate it against. And so that was a real learning process for me as well as stakeholders. <laughs> So this is an example of how we'll work through in the MSAB of going from goals to performance metrics, where we have this goal, say, biological sustainability, a real high-level aspirational goal. Good. So we define a general objective, avoid critical stock sizes. That's, that's a good objective, but it isn't really measurable. So let's define this as a me measurable objective, and we may have multiple measurable objectives to meet this goal, or, or underneath this goal, or even underneath this general objective. But one measurable objective, like maintain a minimum spawning stock biomass, where we define a minimum of 20% of unfished biomass, we define a time frame, a long term, say evaluated over 20 years, we're actually doing over 10. This slide's not quite correct with the MSAP. And then the tolerance, uh, a 10% chance. Say, we, we want to have only a 10% risk of falling below that, that minimum stock size. So that's a measurable objective, and we've been working through the MSAP in this process quite a bit. Um, and we'll do a little bit more this afternoon. I promise it won't be um, too bad. <laughs> so 
we also talk about means objectives to ends objectives, and this is that step going from general to measurable, of going from a means objective to, a, to an ends objective, where we have a threshold and um, the time frame and the metric type is the tolerance. And this, I always frame this uh, in terms of risk. So even though you might define your uh, objective as maintaining above a minimum stock size, I'll typically report it as the probability of going below that stock size. So um, I guess I think about the probability of bad things happening. And that develops your performance metric, which would be this probability the stock is less than 20% of a zero over, I guess, a 20-year period on that slide after simulating an annual process of 100 times. And so that's long enough term for me. So that's how we develop performance metrics, which are then reported. But we need the management procedures to then evaluate. And a management procedure, you can think about it as things that we control, the things that we can make decisions on and control in the system, or at least that we choose to control. There may be some things we choose not to control. So we can choose how we collect data. We can choose how we assess the stock or um, what the estimation model is. And then we can choose what the harvest setting rules um, are. And I just want to remind people there's no perfect choice. There's no one best choice here because we have objectives that are often conflicting and we need to evaluate the trade-offs between those. When we, when we identify management procedures, which we'll work a bit on in this meeting, they can be simple or complex. They can be as simple as if the survey goes up, the catch goes up, or they be, can be as complex as an SPR type approach. <laughs> so this is really key to have stakeholders and managers involved to help determine procedures to be tested. So we have a management procedure at IPHC. I mentioned it earlier, this SPR-based harvest policy, and then we want to distribute catch limits to each IPHC regulatory area. That's the ultimate goal of this management procedure. So the current sort of default management procedure or framework here is to think about it coast-wide with a coast-wide assessment as, a, as is being currently done and a coast-wide fishing intensity level, which is this FSPR level. And that feeds in to determine what the total mortality is in that green box, which is then subdivided into a TCY, which is mainly O26 um, component. And that TCY is then distributed out to the regulatory areas as catch limits to each sector within each regulatory area limit. And so that distribution process can, can be um, a number of different steps as well. That all feeds into the decision process, which is basically the annual meeting every year. And we have the different boards that consider all those inputs. The commissioners consider all those inputs as well as input from the boards. And then we end up with regulatory area mortality limits, which is the end product that we want. Alan, this yeah. is a giant diagram. Uh, I think it may be worth pausing here to let it yeah. settle in for folks to digest really what this what this is. Uh, and while I'm suggesting, would you be able to explain SPR again for those that maybe aren't as familiar with what SPR is? That yeah yeah good point. We'll talk a little bit about it later in the meeting, but for for this, it probably would have been good to include it here. So SPR stands for spawning potential ratio. And what spawning potential ratio means is it, you think about it as if you did not fish on the stock, there would be some spawning potential or spawning biomass per recruit. Think about it like that. For every fish that's born into the population, it has some spawning potential in the future. And when you don't fish on that, there's some level of that. Some fish die of natural mortality um, along the way, and they may never get to spawn but they have some spawning potential. When we fish on the population, we reduce the population and thus we reduce the spawning biomass per recruit or the spawning potential of, of the stock or uh, of an individual recruit. You can think about it that way too. And so you think about you're reducing the spawning potential of the stock by fishing and then you divide that by the um, spawning potential of the stock without fishing and that's the ratio between the two. So if that ratio is 100%, that means there's no fishing going on, and it's an unfished stock. If that ratio is 50%, then you've reduced the spawning potential of the stock by 50%. Um, if it's 40%, you've reduced the spawning potential by 60%. So 
theoretically, if you fished every single fish, the spawning potential ratio in that year would be zero, which is a difficult thing to do. Peggy? And just for clarification, <clears throat> thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. Not already. true. <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, that 100%, if we didn't fish, thanks, um, would only refer to those fish that would be vulnerable to the directed fishery, right? So it would not be, it would not take into account natural mortality or bycatch, among a few other things. Actually, um, SPR takes into account all sources of mortality, of, all sources of fishing mortality. So it does take into account bycatch. So all sources of mortality from all different sectors, whether directed or not, are accounted for in this SPR calculation. So for example, if there was no directed fishery, um, but there was a bycatch fishery out there, the SPR would not be 100%. It would be lower than that. And we've, we've seen some simulations where I've done that. Um, in, in my results, it shows the, the spawning potential would be reduced to about 80%, I think, in the M current MSC results, something like that. But you, you're, you're right, the relationship to natural mortality is interesting because natural mortality and fishing mortality are competing sources of mortality. So if you think about it, if you followed a single fish through its lifetime when it um, was born without fishing, Maybe it suffered natural mortality at age three and never and never had the opportunity to spawn. Um, and if you followed another fish throughout its lifetime, maybe it spawned but suffered natural mortality when it was 20 years old. So it had spawned a couple of times. Now fishing can come along and say, we fished and we, we took that fish out of the population before it died naturally, or vice versa. Maybe the the fish was um, died naturally before it could be taken by the fishery. So there's basically competing sources of na of mortality there. So it isn't always oh the fish you removed would have spawned because some of those fish might have been caught and may have not have spawned because they suffered natural mortality. So that's why it's a bit of a complex relationship um, when looking at. So that, that's the, the brief background SPR. I've talked about SPR in the past. Um, there's some slides that we can always bring up or, or direct people to to understand the concept more. But don't be worried if you don't understand it because it actually took me years to really start getting my head around it. And I'm only starting to get my head around it now. But the way to really think about it is not worry too much about the details, but it's a measure of fishing intensity, how intensely we want to harvest the stock that accounts for all sources of mortality and all sources of, um, from all different sectors of all sizes. And so that's really the key point here is it's an improvement on previous management strategies that didn't actually account for the mortality on all sizes in the fishing. So thanks for the SPR background. Um, there's, I know there's also some slides, we may cover it later in this week, but there's some slides when SPR was first introduced to, to this group as well, that I found are quite helpful. So if folks want a okay. bit more background, we can pull those up too. Um, going back to also the, the slide we see on the screen right now and the current diagram, um, for, for reference kind of where this group has gone over the, the past couple of years, uh, first was actually developing this, this image. Yeah. When we've talked about scale so far, that's addressing the blue hexagon in the bottom left corner. Our efforts over this week and the coming years are going to be more focused on the blue hexagon in the center and then combining those two blue hexagons. Or, or talking about both of them in tandem at least. Yeah. And, and that's the, the key point of this um, figure is the management inputs of the blue hexagons. And those are things the MSAB is really going to focus on. But let's not lose sight of the black boxes as well, which are more scientific inputs. But um, the details of the science input have been reviewed by the SRB and continue to be reviewed by the SRB. But part of this is, this is the whole management procedure. And part of that management procedure is like, do we want to use coastwide assessment as the black box or is there something different to use um, in that context, such as just the survey index? Uh, I see Chuck's hand. Yes, 
Thanks. In looking at that particular slide and in the green boxes, will this, this slide or this distribution <coughs> format change as we get into the utilizing the TCEY now, including U26, because this is an old diagram. I mean, I guess it depends on, there'll be further discussion on it, but is there a potential to link that U26 into the distribution? Yeah, that's a great question, Chuck. I, I think it's a little bit out of context in the, this MSC 101 presentation, but thanks for bringing that up, and that's something that we should probably consider. That That is an annual meeting recommendation that I, I overlooked. Um, but that is something that maybe we do have to consider. My suggestion right now is for the MSAB to continue on the task that they have in, in looking at distribution. Um, and IPHC staff has been tasked with providing some background to the commissioners on what the implications of accounting for the U26 as well, um, the U26 limits as well. Um, and so once that research comes out, which, Ian, will that be available for the next annual meeting, the U26 paper? Um, that should be available by the next annual meeting, and then the MSAB can work off of that research as a background, rather than us going sort of blindly into what the consequences are. But good um, reminder that, yeah, we should probably keep that in mind. Another thing related to your question is TCUI isn't actually O26. It does contain some U26 in there as well from like the recreational fisheries, for example. Um, so Ian and I were just talking the other day. It's like, you know what? We really need to make sure this is clear. Maybe we update some terms as well. But you're right. There's some updating to do to this figure, um, and it's definitely dynamic. <clears throat> and, we'll, you know, throughout the MSAB process, um, we'll keep reviewing this figure, and if anybody has suggestions how to make this figure a little prettier, please let me know. <laughs> Maybe even improve the colors on it. So that's the management procedure that feeds into the, the MSE process. So we'll have a whole bunch of different sort of specifications of management procedures. We've already had different values of SPRs, different um, control rules which adjust those SPRs at low biomass. It, uh, I, I see Jim's hand. Oh, sorry. Is that, is that, is yeah, yeah. So, it, it, more just a clarification. Um, so, will this document also be on the the website eventually, as is under the list of documents? This uh, presentation. Yeah, I think we can we can put this up. I didn't write a document because I just had a lot of other documents to write. Yeah. Yeah, I'm hoping this will be posted. Okay. Um. So, 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 yeah, and, 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 and this is really the MSC 101, and this is where the MSAB is going to bounce off of to um, really start discussions later this week and for the next two years, actually. But I think it's a good reminder for all of us to do this. Chris? Sorry, you, you might have touched on this when I was out of the room. One thing is the operating model simulates a population, and then you admit it's certain, you bring in certain uncertainty and is there like, for instance, you know, you, you, you make these assumptions about the population dynamics. Is there in, in part of an MSE, is there a process of where you try to test those assumptions on the population dynamics? Yeah. Is yeah. that? So, yeah, yeah. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that later when we talk about the framework. But, but basically the simulation involves an operating model. And the operating model is meant as a depiction of reality admitting that we're not certain exactly what reality is. If we knew exactly what it was, we'd have one simulation trajectory and we'd say, if we did this, this would happen. But we don't. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. So part of developing an operating model is coming up with those assumptions. And, um, and once you have those assumptions, you want to what's called condition the operating model. And conditioning the operating model is basically looking at all the data that you have and making sure that your model agrees with the observations that you have. And so the way I've done conditioning in the past is I've actually fit the operating model to those data and then characterized the uncertainty around that. As we get into the multi-area operating model, um, it's going to be challenging to do that conditioning process, but we're just going to have to bring in all sorts of data and ground truthing um, and review process as well 
to, to make sure that the operating model is not only a depiction of what we think could happen in the stock, but represents the range of uncertainty that we want it to as well. Okay, is that, is that, are those assumptions, and they probably are, I just forgot about them, like is it documented anywhere, like here are the assumptions that were made? So, um, so yeah, th that's a good point. In the development of the multi-area uh, model, the, 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 and this is where Steve Berkoff has really been helpful, is um, in, in terms of programming, the, the way that you should program, which is the way that I've never programmed in my life, is you should develop a document that specifies what you want to program, right? And then you program based on those specifications. Instead, me, I just like, I want to code. And so I go in and I code it. And I say, oh, now I'll develop a document that shows you what I did in my code. But working in the team, we need to have that tech technical document. And we're currently writing that technical document. That technical document will then guide Steve to program up all those details. Um, but the other benefit of this technical document is now it's a document that um, shows all of our assumptions, all of the equations and everything that can be re reviewed by anybody. And the SRB will see that document and probably be a big part of the review process in October. Okay, so we don't have something like that for the coast-wide just because of like, uh, but we will have something like that for the multi-area. So the, the coast-wide was developed from the stock synthesis program, which has its own assumptions in there. And it was developed from uh, the assumptions used in the stock assessment and then expanded on those assumptions. So the, really the documentation on the coast-wide MSE is looking back at the assessment model and how the assessments modeled certain things and then looking back at the MSAB documents where I've said these are the changes I've made and the assumptions I've made to that. So, so, so yeah, so as you can see there's a lot of work to developing an operating model. It not only um, it only, not only means we have to go define what the operating model are and all those assumptions and the equations and everything, we have to code it. And we have to code it in a, in a meaningful way, in a way that's fast, uh, you know, that operates fast on a, on a computer sense in time um, and, and has a lot of um, – and produces the things, the outputs that we need in this MSE process. So it's, it's, it's important to make sure that we do get that right. So we have the simulation and evaluation with this operating model. It's going to be the population that we're simulating, and we're going to produce outputs. And those outputs are going to be summarized in terms of performance metrics, which are developed from the objectives. So here we are circling back around to the objectives. Um, now, objectives and performance metrics are typically related to conservation, like keeping the biomass above some limit, yield, maximizing yield, and stability in yield, not having too much change from year to year. And these are where we examine the trade-offs. There's usually trade-offs between all of these objectives. And we started doing that in the MSAB, and it was, um, I found the MSAB members to be very insightful on these trade-offs, and I was very impressed with the evaluation. So we'll look at some of those tomorrow morning. So, yeah. so we, I take it you've done the first draft of the operating model for a coastwide on scale, and that's what we based our decisions on last fall. Yeah. Do you have any slides that kind of show what we've learned about the dynamics of the halibut resource based on that operating model? So that's like, that's, you know, yeah. size and age and the effect of strong versus small year class and basically the yield during high recruit terms versus the yield during low that you could share with folks so they kind of understand a little bit of what we know, how the stock performs based on this work? Yeah, that, that's a really good point. Um, I presented a little bit of that stuff at the last MSAB meeting and probably didn't even present it. I just showed you with the Explorer tool. Um, the, I haven't put any slides together specifically on that, but I, there are a lot of things we learned. I think one thing we learned is that getting back to catch levels of 100 million pounds coast-wide is probably very unlikely, you know? And so we have learned a lot of things like that. It, it would be, you know, that would be a nice thing in my spare time to to come back and say, what have we learned? And, and to be honest, with the team, maybe we do have that time now to, to, to take a deeper look into these things. I think that helps people ground truth what their management yeah. objectives would be. You know, I think mm -hmm. we've gone through the process of wanting to have one objective where we get back to 56 million pounds a year. But based on the work that's been done the last couple of years, there's some good reality checks on what's likely in the near future versus long-term of the stock. Yeah. As well and as what is some of the natural fluctuations in the stock? Are you going to be able to keep the spawning biomass at 40% long term? Or yeah. is really that just a mark that's going to happen on average and, you know, 25% of the time you'll be below it and 25% ahead you'll be above it? 
Right. And just helping to characterize that, I think, would be real informative. Yeah. Yeah. And so I did do simulations with, like, what if weighted age was always low? What if recruitment was always low? And, and those were pretty insightful. I think there was a figure in one of the MSAB 12 documents with different colors showing those simulations. But, but yeah, Glenn? Thanks, Alan. This might be a little off topic, but I was wondering how does the MSC process sort of um, incorporate institutional dynamics? In other words, can you look back at other MSC processes and then try and think about within the specific institutions that it was trying to operate in, what were some of the challenges or roadblocks to being effective for implementation? Or do you look at the MSC process as simply following a certain prescribed approach to developing an operating model, and then you have the other institutional <clears throat> political dynamics on top of that. Is there a feedback between those two, and if so, how does that work? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. There have been a few papers written, you know, like Doug Butterworth and others are always talking about challenges of MSE and, and all that stuff, and they get into that a little bit, I would think. But, um, you, you know, I, I think the MSE process is, it's something meant to inform, uh, you know, a management procedure. But I think each agency or management institution does operate differently. And an example here at IPHC is the the tuna world, and something actually um, encouraged by Rob Cronlin um, at at past meetings that we've had was we should put all of the objectives up front and then develop a management procedure to meet those objectives, and then the outcome is simply there's no decision-making process, really. The final outcome is we apply the management procedure, it spits out a number, and that's the number that we have for the catch limit or wh whatever we're trying to manage next year. IPHC has that inst is an institution that's not used to that method. They have this annual meeting, they have this long well, not long, but um, this process in place of making decisions. And I don't think we're in the place to lose that right now. So we're incorporating that into the MSE process. But maybe in the future, as this process goes on, there, there we can learn from it, and maybe we do want to change how the, the management process works. And so that was actually, it's right here. That last step of the decision-making process is a concern to me because they can deviate from the management procedure. If we've tested a management procedure and we say this, if we, if we manage in this way, it meets our objectives, and then the decision's never made on to, to agree with that management procedure, we're not sure if we're going to meet our objectives. So when I do the simulations, we'll incorporate what I call implementation variability, and we'll try to actually simulate the decision process as well. And then we might do some robust testing, robustness testing, where we say, what if the commissioners always made a decision this side or this side, and we see how the management procedure, how the, the objectives respond to those departures. But you're right, there's a lot of institutional framework in the MSE process, you might say. Alan, I uh, just want a quick time check that we're yep. getting close to lunch. I don't want to cut off this conversation. I think we have a bit of flexibility to uh, go on, maybe just keep an eye out for a, a reasonable break point. Yeah, so um, I guess the question is, should we just finish this before lunch? I know some observers came to see this um, that might want to leave during lunch. Um, and um, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to finish this. We might be 10 minutes over if that's okay. Yeah, I think we have lunch to 1.30 anyway, and it's served here, so not a problem. Okay, so I'll try to move on a little bit, and, and remember, this is just sort of the background for this meeting, and um, we'll have plenty of opportunities during the meeting to further discuss these points. But, so what's the difference between an operating model and a management procedure? The way I like to think about it is the operating model are things we don't choose to, or we don't control, or we choose not to control, such as changes in natural mortality, or environmental effects, things like that. Whereas the management procedures are the things we choose to control, like how we collect data, um, what the actual harvest control rule looks like, like 30-20, SPR 46%, all those different things. What are the biomass reference points? Those choices that we can make. And that, that's really the difference there. So we put this all together into what's called a closed-loop simulation. 
And the closed loop simulation, closed loop means that it has a feedback on itself, where we have an operating model of the stock dynamics, the fisheries dynamics, things we're really not trying to control, where you fish, how selectivity changes, et cetera. And that feeds into the population outputs in some year. Um, the population is what it is in the simulation. We then simulate the management procedure, which involves collecting data from that population, estimation, applying a harvest control rule. That produces a TCUI that feeds back into the fisheries, or actually a total mortality. There's the total mortality removal feeds back into the population, and this is an annual process with this feedback loop. So that's really the key to MSE, and the, at least the simulation part of MSE. So I want to give you a really quick illustration, a hypothetical example that's similar to halibut, where we start with an operating model, and we see at the top is recruitment, and those are estimates of recruitment from historical period. And then we have in the middle relative spawning biomass. Let's think of the status of the stock where it's declined over time across these years. And then at the very bottom, we have the total removals from the stock due to the fisheries. fisheries and um, those are assumed to be known. So we introduce, we have this variability in the operating model, which are different colored lines. So these are different, what I call simulation trajectories, different possible states of the population that may have occurred in the past, where we have potentially different recruitment levels. There's one that's way out there, which is our assumption. Maybe the uncertainty is really large. Um, and we have, you can see on the relative spawning biomass, the light blue line is actually outside the original confidence intervals, which is fine because we're characterizing uncertainty in that way. At the bottom, the catch history is assumed known. Now, where this differs is as we project one year, so now we've projected one year into the future and we've simulated, let's say recruitment is what it is at the top, that's a simulated recruitment, and that results in a population that looks like the middle part. And that means that we should take these catch levels at the bottom part, which are now um, the dots at the bottom. And so th this is the management uh, application of the management procedure says take those catch okay. levels, and this is how the population responds. So we keep doing this for you know many, many annual cycles into the future, and we get these different trajectories of the population, as you can see in the middle there, and we get different catch levels. So you can look at things like, you know, the catch levels on the dark blue line at the bottom actually started really small, but then went really big. Um, and the red line sort of stayed somewhat even, but went sort of big, but the population remained stable. So there's all these different possibilities, but this is the application of a consistent management procedure across all of these trajectories as well. So we're not really interested in what each individual trajectory looks like in MSE. In stock assessment, you would be, but you'd only be interested in the near term. What we're interested in the MSE is what the resulting characterization of the, the distribution of these trajectories looks like at the very end of the time period. Yeah, Jim. So I know we had this discussion before, <clears throat> but the, the, the operating models and the end of results coming from the MSE process, they're, they're not predictive, so what you're showing a few years out, um, you're because you've always had a hard time getting our mind around the short term. What what the what the what the results are showing short term as opposed to what the long term. And the whole thing though is it's the long term results, right? It's they're, how reliable, I guess you would say, or how how useful are the short term results as you're going through on the first say on this one, the first say 15 years, as far as reality. Yeah. And, and, and that's a good point. Um, so the, the, the reason is is that Ian and I were really concerned about confusing tactical decision making and strategic decision making. And the tactical decision making is you're trying to predict what you should do now, where strategic is looking like what you should do in the long term. But in that long term, we want to be aware of how we get to the long term. So for example, here, this may not be a very good management procedure because look at how low these total removals go. That's probably not good for the viability of the fishery, right? It might actually just result in no fishery in the future. So we might want to develop a different management procedure that has more constant catch and then maybe takes longer to get up to these long-term levels. So it is important to consider short, medium, and long-term. 
how realistic those are, remember, we're characterizing the operating model as having a very wide range of uncertainty. So we're sort of characterizing the extreme event in here. And whether or not, you know, characterizing things as probability that the stock will go extinct in the next three years is probably not the best thing to use this MSE model for because the uncertainty was really developed for the long term. And we'd want to develop different models for that. And that, that was sort of the idea behind un, the, there's the different three, there's conceptual, strategic, and tactical decision-making models, and we would characterize those models differently. So I think it's good, um, it, the models are useful, the operating model is useful to rank management procedures across them, but it's not useful to predict exactly that you're going to catch 40 million pounds in year 25. So we, we then, really the outcome of this is summarizing the performance metrics, which the performance metrics here are long-term performance metrics summarized over the gray period at the end of the time series and um, summarized by this distribution. And so those performance metrics might be at the top there is something like um, the, my mouse doesn't work, but the, um, the probability, the number of simulations that fall below some threshold, which you see the darker gray area on the right there, or the, um, the median average catch, sort of the central part of the distribution on the bottom there. Um, those are different performance metrics that we might want to characterize out of this. And there's lots and lots of performance metrics that we can do. That's all right. So, the, um, so, so that's just a real simple illustration of MSE simulations. We want to then present the results of this. And um, as I showed before, this is, we include, I think, 1,000, sometimes 2,000 different trajectories to characterize these distributions. And so looking at each individual trajectory is not reasonable. So we summarize them in terms of distributions. So what we have here on the right is a um, performance metric, the median average total mortality. Think of that, the dots, as the median um, total mortality limit for the coast that would be experienced. And so you can see on the x-axis is the input fishing <laughs> intensity, where fishing intensity increases from the left to the right. And on the vertical axis is the actual performance metric. So as you fish harder, you get more yield. So that makes sense. But there's a lot of variability in that yield. Um, so that's the performance metric, the management procedure. And then what I've plotted here are quantiles. So 50% of the simulations fall within the band that I'm showing here. So we can then see things like, okay, as we start harvesting at fishing intensities greater than that SPR 0.4, we're really not getting much return. But we are going from a 56 to a 54. So this is one way of um, displaying results. And we actually call this We've called this a statistic of interest because it's just basically a median. We can also display results as probabilities as well. For example, how often is the catch below 30 million pounds? And I can tell you at an SPR about 44. In this example, it would be about 25% of the time because that's a 25% quantile. So we often present results just simply as a single performance metric. But the other way we present results is the trade-offs between performance metrics. So um, users definitely participate in this, and this is these plots are actually from the MSE Explorer now. Um, so you can actually do this trade-off for, for Adam in particular, because he really likes these. Um, and thanks to Piera, she, she programmed this one in using ggplot, which is quite awesome. Um, so we have now two performance metrics that we're looking at on, on different axes. We have um, and we can think about it as on the vertical is the variability in catch and on the horizontal is the actual catch. So you can see as the catch increases, goes to left to right, the variability in the catch also increases. So those are two competing objectives that we have and we might want to define a middle point in there somewhere. So these are trade-off plots and we can view all of these in the MSE Explorer. So the other way to present results is in a, in a table with lots of colors and shadings and bold and all that fun stuff. So I, I realize this table is starting to get a bit busy, so I'll be um, taking advice on how to improve this table. But basically what this is is um, 
at the very, very top, the um, there we go. The um, we have the management procedures across the top here, which include a control rule of 3020, and then different constraints, which we'll talk about. So these are actual results. We'll talk about these tomorrow morning, and different um, SPR rates. Here in this section are the performance metrics. And these are the three primary performance metrics the MSAB is currently working with. They're things like um, keeping the relative spawning stock biomass above some level, uh, stability is AAV in the catch, and then the median average total mortality, where we just want to maximize the total mortality um, subject to meeting the other two performance metrics or objectives. So what I've colored here is in green is where the um, objective is actually met and pink is where it's not met. So remember our stability objective was keeping the stability above 15% by at least 25% of the time. So we want to keep the stability to at some level at least 25% um, of the time. And so those, those are above that 25% threshold, so they don't meet that objective, so we don't actually end up ranking them in the bottom of the table. And what we can get out of the bottom is an overall ranking of the various management procedures. And this is key, where now we've identified this one as the best performing management procedure because it meets those green, those objectives there, and maximizes the total mortality. But then we look at two, and it's basically the same. And then we look at three, and it's not a lot different, it's just a few, a little bit less than that. <clears throat> so this is another way um, to present the results. Uh, Alan, I'm just wondering quickly if you're gonna um, present the details or sort of your formula for ranking at some point. Um, it's, it's very simple in terms of this, I'm just using the defined objectives and then ranking it. So. Right now our objective is, and we can discuss this during later this afternoon as well, but, but um, really briefly, our first objective is to meet the conservation objective of maintaining the spawning biomass above some level. So we see, did we meet that? Yes, we met that across all of them based on our defined objective. Um, the second objective is to um, whether we uh, met the stability objective, and so it's just pink or red, whether the, which met that objective. And then for any that met those first two, I just maximized the total mortality. So you can see I've looked over all the ones that met those objectives, this is the maximum total mortality, because notice here, there's a slightly greater maximum total mortality at the cost of not meeting that objective. So these ones, twos, threes, fours, and fives are just uh, ranking simply the total mortality on there. And we can get more into more complex ranking procedures as we proceed. It's just right now we really do have a hierarchical set of objectives that we're working with. Something useful to discuss later. So then comes the end of this, the application of a, manage, of a management procedure. And really the key to this is consistent application because that's how we've simulated it. We've simulated it to be consistently applied over time. Um, we can learn from the application of this. We might learn in a couple of years that maybe it doesn't work as we expected because of some, something we didn't account for in the simulation process. But the key here is that we're not looking at the MSE process as an annual process. That would be a bit too much work for me, first of all, but the goal here is long-term strategic thinking. It's not, um, it's not tactical decision-making on how to change something every year. Um, so, and then again, there might have that implementation variability where the, the decision-making process and the fishing process doesn't quite get, doesn't quite result in the total mortalities of what the limit was, and so we can introduce that in implementation variability and something that we need to do in the future. So that's the application process, and reminder then that the MSE is a process, it's not a one-time product where we have goals and objectives, management procedures, the simulation, and then the consistent application of the, the, um, the management procedure. And that there's a lot of feedback in, in here as well as input from the different boards. And I've sort of put this figure together a while ago thinking about where each board comes in, where the MSAB is really instrumental in defining goals and objectives, management procedures, helping set up simulations, the SRB reviews all that. The MSAB sees the results, 
reports all those results um, to the boards as well as the commissioners, and the commissioners are making the final decision on application. And communication is the key to this, which is why we're having this meetings, and I really appreciate the time that people do put into this, because without communication, this process wouldn't be what it is currently. And that's everything I have on MSE 101, and hopefully that was a little helpful review. Thanks very much, Alan. I think that was um, a really good summary of quite a bit of the background of the work we've done to date. Um, we are just getting into lunch, so I don't want to take too much more time, uh, but maybe we could have some informal questions over lunch yeah. to, to talk with folks. Uh, th there was one point that I wanted to add um, on top of this. So I think particularly for some of the observers might be helpful, some of the new folks is, uh, well, this is a lot of background about what we've done at some of the specifics of MSE. Realize we didn't really talk about um, kind of like what, why we're here. Why, why, is the, why is the commission undertaking an MSE as opposed to how things had been done before, right? So I'll take a, a brief stab at it. A common, common practice in, in fisheries management is to use the best assessment-based approach, where cash is determined by taking the best estimate of the number of fish out there and multiplying it by a harvest rate. So the analyst will say, "There's, I think there's this many fish out there, and this is the harvest rate we should use, and that's your catch. For that to work, um, you need to know that your assessment is reliable and consistent, that it's right, and that your target harvest rate is well determined. And I would argue that that probably is not a tenable assumption in really any assessment. Uh, there's, we, we, we saw in this, in this presentation that um, there's, for example, many kinds of uncertainty. There, any, anyone can pick the best assessment model. Right? Um, so th this best model approach as could have uncertainty or does have uncertainty with it. It also doesn't clearly define fishery objectives or consider any alternative harvest procedures. The analyst picked or the decision maker picked a harvest control rule and didn't consider maybe any alternatives explicitly. So how do we get away from this best assessment approach? One way is a management-oriented approach or a management strategy evaluation. And so in a management strategy evaluation, we start by defining our objectives, suite of possible management procedures, and then all the ranges of uncertainty we want to consider. You know, uncertainty from different assessment models or different model parameterizations, how ocean productivity may change in the future, or whatever. Uh, so we consider those. Then the populations, births, deaths, are simulated uh, into the future along with harvest, simulated into the future over time. And we, by simulating these uh, populations and harvests over time, we understand how the population and harvests change in response to one another, and then we compare those to how they meet the objectives. So we're, we're undertaking an MSC to get away from this best assessment approach, which doesn't explicitly consider the whole suites of uncertainty that we've spent some time talking about this morning, or possible, different possible management procedures. So that's what we're here for. That's what our job is, is to define those different types of uncertainties, to define those different candidate management procedures, and to define those fishery objectives. The reason there's a collection of people around the table that we have here is there's many different objectives, often competing objectives, different management procedures. I think the commission is looking to make sure that those range of options are captured in a single recommendation or suite of recommendations that are put forward for decision makers. It's a lot of the mouthful for lunch, sorry. But I think it's, it's important to realize kind of why we're, why we're doing something different than what we've done for 95 years. All right. any, other, any other questions? Uh, otherwise, maybe we can have some more informal conversation over lunch, which is next door, I think. Right right. Okay. Thanks very much, everyone.
was a long 10 minutes, sorry. <laughs> we needed it. Yeah. Target, not a limit. Okay, so it, looking at the rest of the agenda, we um, we have space for unfinished business review of the day. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit now about the distribution objectives. As folks will see, there's there's an hour here for report uh, drafting. I don't know if we're going to need the full amount of time today. We will strive to be be done by four. Um, and then anyone else who wants to stick around for writing is welcome to, to do so. So with that, let's uh, oh, hand it over to Alan to um, bring us up to speed on the distribution piece. Excuse me, uh, Chair. Through the chair, through the chair, may I add something for this afternoon? Oh yeah, yeah. You want to wrap up for the? Well, I just wanted yeah, to make sure I get that point out. You. So uh, it's a 5:45, and will carry us down to um, the Halibut Point Rec Center. So they'll pick us up at 5:45, and then we'll leave there at 8 p.m. Headed back to the West Mark. So we'll uh, we'll head at as soon as they drop us off at the Halibut Point Rec Center, we'll meet there at 8 o'clock for them to pick us up at that same point. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, we, we have uh, 20 minutes to, to introduce distribution. As we said earlier this morning, there's going to be a few opportunities to talk about it through the next uh, couple of days. Yeah, so maybe the I think the best thing for me to do is just to go right through the presentation and we can have discussion at the end for as long as people want today and then we'll pick this up again. Okay, so um, in summer of 2018, some objectives were proposed by the ad hoc working group uh, that met to discuss goals and objectives. And they identified some general objectives from what had um, occurred at previous MSAT meetings. And one was to conserve spatial population structure, so making sure that we have spawning biomass uh, across the various regions of the coast. Uh, to limit catch variability, maximize directed fishing yield, uh, and then this fourth one, minimize potential of no catch limit for directed fishery. Um, and um, basically what happened is many of these coastwide objectives were translated um, to biological regions and IPHC regulatory areas. So they're just looking at it in the distribution way. Um, so uh, is it selected on the PowerPoint? It keeps unselecting it for some reason. Or maybe my, my there we go, thanks. Um, so, in terms of biological sustainability, this, there's this concept of conserving spatial population structure, and this is um, defined in proportions in each of the biological regions. And the reason that I'm uh, defining this as proportions <coughs> is that we're, def we're looking at this coast-wide, and then we just want to make sure there's some proportion of the biomass in each of the different biological regions. If we define this as an absolute sense, the sum of it would be a coast-wide reference point where we're already defining a coast-wide reference point of 20% B0 um, as, a, as a limit at least, and we may define a target as well. So this would just be maintain a defined minimum proportion of spawning biomass in each biological region, making sure that it doesn't go below some proportion. Those proportion, those minimums have not been defined, and then reporting this as a performance, uh, a measurable performance metric as a probability as well as a statistic of interest. Um, so we, we would want to think about what a tolerance of this would be as well as the minimum proportions for each regulatory area. And we can try to look at, at least summarize what the range of proportions have been. Did I do that? No, I didn't. I thought I did in this. But we can look at what the range of proportions have been over the past 
um, at least estimated from the survey data in the last 20 years. So related to that is the target, and we might want to choose to um, define a proportion of the O26 Pacific halibut biomass, for example, in each region. Um, and this would then define a minimum and a maximum that we'd want to be around with some higher level of tolerance, for example, and looking over the long and the short term on this and the same. Let me see if I did it. I can really, whoa, it's jumping around. Okay, so, um, so this one, though, if we do not have a coast-wide TCEY target, we may not need to define these as a proportion. And that may be um, then the sum of the O26 halibut biomass in each biological region would be the coast-wide level. We just want to be really careful if we do something like that, that we all of a sudden don't um, come up with um, values that are really super high, like over 100 million pounds coast-wide or something like that. So again, objectives do have to be realistic. Uh, the other one, 2.2a, uh, would be limit catch variability, and that would just be having the same objective of limiting the variability from year to year 15%, but, do the, but look at this by regulatory area in, in this concept, and then some other statistics of interest reported with that. And then maximize directed fishing yield. Uh, a working group defined a number of things, maximizing the average TCY, very similar to the current primary objective, 2.2, I think it is. And, um, and then also maybe defining here, it might be more appropriate to define a minimum TCY by regulatory area. And um, I'll show some examples of what, how that's already been um, brought into the, into the process. And then finally, 2.4a on the very bottom down there is to minimize potential of no catch limit for the directed fishery. This can be also phrased as minimize um, closures due to the control rule. And this would just be a, um, we can de define this as when the directed yield equals zero and have some tolerance on that as well if we want to. Or we could just um, report back a statistic of interest on this one, how often the directed fishery is closed. And we've looked at that in the past on the coast-wide level. And, and, and actually, to correct myself, it's not that the directed fishery is closed. That might be the case in some instances, but there might also be the case that the catch sharing plan just doesn't leave any um, TCUI for the directed fishery, so they would have a zero catch limit. So other objectives related to distribution, we've seen at the annual meeting, 2A defined a minimum TCY of 1.65 million pounds, um, subject to conservation concerns. And then 2B defined a share-based allocation with 30% of the weight on the current interim procedure and 70% of the weight on a value of 20% proportion in their um, 2B region. So I just want to make the note here I was really excited to see this at the annual meeting because I think, one, it can inform a management procedure. We can put these directly into a management procedure for distributing the catch um, and see what the outcomes are. But they're also useful in defining an, object, an objective. In looking at 2A, their objective is to maintain the TCY above 1.65 million pounds, and 2B is to maybe their objective is to have a share around 20% of the TCY coastwide. So I think this is, that was a really useful outcome of the annual meeting and can inform our process here. So looking at that, how that would feed into this. So 2.1 was maintain a biomass around a target that optimizes fishing activities, which is basically a proportion of the O26 halibut in each biological region. And maybe we rephrase that as regulatory area here. Um, and so you think about this as what 2B has said, um, maintaining the proportion of T TCY at a target level, and right now they've defined a 20% maybe or, or some uh, weighting factor of that, but they could define a, a ratio and just see what the outcome of the management procedure is and how often it meets their um, objective. 
and then related to 2A's, um, uh, the, the TCY and 2A that was decided at the annual meeting, we can classify that under maintaining the TCY above a minimum level by regulatory area. So this is easy, where 2A now would then be the TCY and 2A is how often is it less than 1.65 million pounds, and there has not been a tolerance defined for that. Um, and, and I think that's something important to realize that was uh, very insightful for the commission to put subject to conservation concerns because there may be reasons that this uh, TCY has to be less than 1.65 million pounds. But see how often that occurs. So that's how I think those two um, outcomes fit into the distribution objectives. So what, what our task here is to define more specific area-specific objectives. Um, and then we haven't really talked about, not to open up a whole nother can of worms, but sector-specific objectives as well. And we can think about this two ways. We can define some sector-specific objectives, or we can translate what the catch sharing plans would say for each sector and how that would go back into an overall TCY for each individual area. And then maybe certain sectors have we need a minimum TCY of this, the other sectors we need the minimum TCY of that or something like that. But um, some things to um, consider. And then finally, you see this is starting to balloon into a lot of different objectives. Um, so it's important that we do identify a few primary objectives so that we can actually evaluate it over instead of having this big mess or big bowl of spaghetti, you might say, of performance metrics. <laughs> um, and, and just to note, we'll always be reporting lots of, of performance metrics, um, so we can look at those other things. But having a small set of primary makes it much more tenable to at least present it to the commissioners. Um, so that brings us back to this page of the things that I, I think we need to come out of. MSAB is, uh, again, an objective related to maintaining catch above a specific level, whether or not we want that in, and if so, what the value is. Uh, conservation objective or spawning biomass target, distribution objectives, so um, we do have another meeting to work on distribution objectives, and then uh, the outcome really of those will be the practical set of performance metrics. Um, and with that, I think that's all that I have. <clears throat> okay. Thanks very much, Ellen, for that. Um, maybe first to see if, if anyone has questions or uh, comments on the last couple of slides that Alan just presented on the distribution pieces. Um, uh, yeah. Peggy? Will we get a copy of this? Yeah, I, I believe all the presentations will be or maybe even have been uploaded to the website. Sure. Yeah. We had an objective once upon a time about minimize uh, wastage, I think it was, or bycatch. You know? Yeah. And it's in a parking lot somewhere. Where is that? Yeah. Um, sorry, I did not present that. Is it in the appendix of documents? You did have it listed in your goals as well. The, the goals that we started, I think, previous presentation with listed uh, um, biological sustainability. Uh, and then the specific objectives, and the last two goals were minimizing wastage. I think it actually said discard mortality and minimizing bycatch. Yeah. yeah. And we do have a general objective on the list of that. We'll discuss that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Should be in the agenda. Mm -hmm. But these are the last two that report to the other objectives. It's somewhere in your document. I okay. read it. <laughs> it's just right now I haven't. Um, Can you do your mic, well, Alan? That was that, that would be good in the discussion of the operating model because um, if that is an important objective to meet, we would have to figure out how to bring that into the um, – and be able to report it as a performance metric. I think, though, in the past we've discussed that it would be complex because discard mortality is related to length, and we'd either have to make an assumption in the operating model or model length, and, and modeling 
length is probably going to be more difficult than modeling areas um, at this point in time. So we put it in the parking lot for that reason. I think Ian has a comment as well. I'd just like to note that the commission's actions over the last couple of years don't actually seem consistent with this goal. Um, based on a, two that I've been involved with, reviews of the minimum size limit, the choices that have been made have not been to minimize discard mortality. They've been to optimize the economics of the fishery at the cost of discard mortality. So it's probably worth considering whether this objective is re it's really about discard mortality or something else. fair enough to have a discussion about it. In my mind, in the past, we've also discussed it that there are certain times in each area when there are a lot of small fish there that haven't grown up to be the 32-inch size. And it's a conscious choice whether you put full fishing pressure in those areas where there's going to be a lot of encounter rates with sublegals, or whether you wait until those areas clear out some. And can you build management procedures that just automatically weight areas with large amounts of sublegals less? And we've talked about building those management procedures. The simple one is you apportion based on O32, as long as we have a size limit, instead of apportioning based on O26. And so at some point, I think that's on. That's what the current policy is, is to basically, apport, well, up until this last meeting, was to apportion based on O32 amongst the areas. And so I do think that objective is relative to what the current thing is going. And I'm not sure where it should best fit, but I would pull out of the parking lot for more discussion at this meeting on how to, where that should fit in and move forward. So, so how does that fall, fall into the, the uh, what came out of the annual meeting of, you know, accounting for all your mortalities, uh, sublegal mortalities within the area you're, you're, you're there, they're, they're caught in. So that doesn't that I'll just take care of that already. They would be accounted for, but they'd be accounted for on the wastage side of the equation rather than the T, rather than the FCEY side. Yeah, I, th I think the difference there is if the objective is to minimize the discard mortality because of optics or something like that, that we might want to have a management procedure that actually does that rather than accounting for it. The SPR-based harvest policy already does account for it. So yeah, it is in the appendix on page 14 of the document 07. And it's basically discard mortality is a small percentage of the longline fishery annual catch um, catch limit. And it's it's defined as less than 10% of the annual catch limit with a tolerance of 25%. And this performance metric's already reported, correct? Is this one of the items that we already see? No, I, I can't actually calculate this in the coastwide model because I'm not modeling uh, size. So that's the problem with this. I would have to make a proxy for discard mortality. I mean, we're dealing with this. <laughs> right. I can do it by by based on age or something. Like if they're younger than this, they're probably less. Yeah. No, it's good, a good reminder, Dan. There, there's a I can sense we're getting close to the end of the day. There's a few side conversations and energy is dropping. I'd like to ask one one more question, if we can, before we totally dissolve, about the um, the area. Alan, a few points in the objectives you talked about area. Uh, do you specifically mean area as a regulatory area or a region? Have folks thought about whether we'd want distribution objectives at the region level versus the regulatory area level? So I've purposefully put it in as ambiguous okay for that reason <laughs> that's what i thought um, <laughs> because but 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 the um I, my suggestion and again i'm um, propose what i think we should do and you can tell me where we're wrong where i'm wrong and that is when we're dealing with conservation or biological sustainability objectives we're operating at the regional level um, and when we're operating on fishery objectives we're at the regulatory area level um, and so I think I had a mistake in my presentation there. So I, I, I agree with that. Um, more pragmatic approach is I think it would be easier. I'm not saying it's right what we should do, but it would be easier to set uh, distribution objectives at the region and then manager procedures that are more regulatory area specific. Could do that too. Uh, 
I think we would make progress faster. I don't know if it would be satisfactory to, <clears throat> to folks. So uh, well, I, I think, don't know the answer. I think it's something to, yeah. to consider. Well, I think as people are considering that, there's two ways to address the region. Mm -hmm. One is you can apportion the region first and then go to areas. The other is you can apportion from the coastwide straight to an area and then run it through your regional filter to see if you're within bounds or out of bounds. And I think it's really important to keep those two approaches on the table mm -hmm. as both possible and not get trapped into just one at this point. Is that uh, basically what you were saying, Adam, though? You're, you're, you're saying you're no. defining your objectives at the region level, but you're defining management procedures at the regulatory area level. Yes, that, that's what I was saying, but I don't know if that's what that's Stan was saying. So, so I see the two as being the same, is that you can define a management procedure that goes directly coastwide to regulatory level, level regulatory area level, but then you Oh, see yeah, if you're meeting your objective yeah. back on the regional level. How would you define the TCEY in 2A as 1.6 exactly. million miles? That's mm -hmm. on the area yeah. level, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. You need to define some object, uh, unless you define it as the management procedure where they always get 1.6 miles. I think they like that. <laughs> what their proposal said, so yeah. Um, and so, 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 I mean, there's a lot of different ways to think about it on this sense, but I think the objective, you have an objective, and whether you put that into the management procedure or evaluate it as an objective, I think you still have the objective there. And so if the management procedure says 20% goes to 2B, that's still your objective, and you can evaluate your objective as always being met by the management procedure. The, the reason I was thinking, uh, the reason I was suggesting that we try to focus distribution objectives at the region level is um, one, it may be less contentious, but more practically, it's fewer objectives. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm concerned about how many years do we go through trying to consolidate our scale objectives from the, the giant list we have to three, and now we're going to add at least nine more distribution objectives on top of the three. It's going to be really difficult for, for us to digest. So if we focused on the regional level or at least generalized objectives um, to the region, Maybe easier to uh, to deal with, but maybe that's not the way to solve the problem. Given what everyone's trying to get out of the process, yeah, yeah. I think you can do the biological objectives at the region, but I think on the man the fishery objectives, I think that either is both. Mm -hmm. So the elements of both on it, and it's mm -hmm. premature right now to try and lock us into one way or the other. It's yeah. better to get them all out on the table and then see if there's a natural order exactly. that falls out. Thoughts from, from others? Okay, I'll say one last thing and then we should then we should probably cut it off. You'll give yourself the last word. Uh, well, just because I know it's going to be controversial. The other is there's two parties to the to the agreement. Um, let's talk about Canada and U.S. Like national shares is another consideration. That creates issues within Region 2, but uh, that's something that, I mean, that's what commissioners spent some time talking about at the, uh, the annual meeting, so another item to consider. Well, well the formula for 2B is, could be even considered as a, a part of like a national share anyways as a proxy because that's kind of what it is. It is. So, uh, but it'd be interesting to see how that would, you know, to look at that as a proxy, well, as, a, as an example. So maybe I'll get the last word. Yeah. So yeah. I I see that. Th so so there's two different angles. We're just approaching it from two, yeah. two different angles, really. One, we can develop a man, and and we found this with Coastwide. Um, we can develop a management procedure that will meet our objective, or vice versa. We can develop a management procedure to see if it meets our objective. And what we can do is we might be able to come up with a management procedure that doesn't have a national share in it, that goes to region and goes to regulatory area, that actually does meet the objective of having a national share of 20%. So um, th th there's two ways to look at it, and, and that's the fun of MSEs. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thoughts from... From others on that before we go into uh, a wrap up for the day. No. 
on on the distribution objectives piece that we just just went through. Yeah. We'll have lots of time for distribution coming up. <laughs> no? Okay. I think we're we're tapped out for the day. So um uh yeah, go ahead, Gary. Yeah, so th uh those of you who are um uh graciously signed up for um, report writing. Uh, you'll notice that we've moved that. Our previous meetings have gone until five o'clock and then report writing has been afterwards for people. And so um, we've tried to make that um, a better system <laughs> uh, in that the report writing is gonna happen between now and five o'clock. So it's not, it doesn't take um, extra time sort of outside of that nine to five work day. Um, so I just thought I would note that, and uh, and I think everybody knows knows who you are uh, if you've decided to stick around for that or not. And and a, another volunteer or two would be wonderful. So. Could I just a a ask a question in general? Nothing. To, it's not part of the MSAB process, but it's in the design of how you lay out the attendees in the report as you report out. Uh, would it be helpful if I, I would find it helpful and maybe others would too that just listing the names of the people versus having the names of the persons attending al along with their their position on the board like recreational fishing or in Canada you know that sort of thing because if you reflect back and look back after a couple of years at who was attending you don't know if it was really what what their positions were and what they are how the discussions went as per the who they're representing so, so sorry you wanted you wanted uh who they represent you want the people attending along with uh affiliation. their affiliation. The affiliation it's just in a the, suggestion if others feel it's, that it, it's it's an, an idea yeah and that's maybe something that dave can fill in on the report for us dave's not here so i think we can do whatever we want <laughs> <laughs> I think Dave can do that remotely. <laughs> Dave's delegates are here. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, just to, to be clear, I think the suggestion we've heard is that um, uh, on uh, Appendix 1 of the reports normally, membership is listed, uh, but it doesn't list the affiliation. That's a suggestion. It may be helpful for readers to understand. Otherwise, you need to look at the, the membership document to know what who is represented there. So, um, I think it's a suggestion we can we can bring forward and at least get advice from the secretariat as to what's most appropriate in terms of their their template. Okay, so a quick recap and thanks for folks for sticking around for today. This morning was largely uh, around some housekeeping items, welcoming some new members, and going through some of the process pieces from the the past number of meetings. Uh, I. I appreciate everyone's attendance coming up to Sitka uh, and the opportunity that we've had to have some other observers participate in the process. Uh, those those two pieces is a large reason why we had the, the MSE 101. Um, and while it was maybe directed more for some of the newer faces around the table, I still think it's a useful process for, for all of us to remind ourselves why, why we're here and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, the afternoon was focused on our goals and objectives and you know to be honest I'm pretty tired of talking about goals and objectives um, but I actually I, I was I was really pleased with the conversation we had today about it uh, the folks that are going to stick around for the report writing will make sure that we compare notes and try to encapsulate some of the recommendations that we had on um, incorporating advice from or guidance from commissioners on how we need to uh, amend the objectives for for the next uh, the next year, um, we'll make sure that there's any specific action items documented in this report now, and then folks will have a chance to review it tomorrow morning before we get going just for, for the for the new faces here. Uh, and with that, Carrie, do you have anything else you want to add? Okay. Then let's close the book here for or one, Alan. One I'm I'm sorry I forgot, but I wanted people to be aware that there is a new. MSE Explorer up. It has a slightly different address than the one at MSAP 012. And so this, what, what I'll try to do is keep this address consistent over time and I'll be updating it over time. And I'll also keep a record of what the tool looked like at past MSAP meetings. So 
so we always have that record. But so if you always go to this, you'll have the most current issue. So this is the or, um, tool, and so this is the most current tool. There's a lot of new features that we'll go over tomorrow. But just in case somebody who is familiar or wants to become familiar, they can um, play around with it tonight. So I think Ed, if you can just leave this up for five minutes or so, that would be great. Thanks a lot. I'd just like to mention one thing that the Allen's presentation is now up on the website for people to review and go back through. And if you have issues um, with this loading, <laughs> so it's probably not going to work at the Westmark for some weird reason. I don't know why. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but here it works. But it seems like when it first comes up, it fails. And then you just hit refresh, F5, or the little circle arrow button on the top, um, and it'll work. It does not work in inter or Internet Edge or whatever that thing is. Um, so I'd try um, anything but that. Okay. Very briefly, I, I won't be here for the uh, remainder of the MS, MSAB meeting, but uh, just a thought. I know that there's some consideration of future meeting locations, and uh, personally, coming to Sitka is great, but I also realize that for some folks, a lot of travel and multiple plane flights can be difficult, so whether we're in the U.S. or Canada, if we can think about locations that are more central than others, I think it might help to facilitate participation, just as a note. We'll, uh, we'll see those that are uh, going out for dinner at quarter to six. Outside the, just outside the hotel, right? Just outside the hotel. Yeah, great. Perfect. All right. We'll see you in a little bit.